uh, the exit. <laughs> so, good morning, everyone. Friends, presenters, and everybody else, good morning. And thanks for being here. A uh, couple of things I want to mention. One is that uh, the program today is being live streamed online through the Ararat Eskegen's uh, Facebook page, their, their, their own website, the Ararat Eskegen website, and on YouTube. So uh, let your friends know that they can, you can email them, tweet them, whatever it is, whatever mode of communication you have at your disposal, let them know that they can be watching this online and tell them to let their friends know because uh, that will certainly help increase the reach of the conference uh, beyond this room. And I, I trust, uh, and Maggie can nod if I'm correct, that the uh, video will be archived online after the event as well. She's nodding, so that's good. So the conference will uh, continue to find people even after it takes place, which is very important. Um, happy St. Patrick's Day. Uh, I failed to pack anything green, uh, which is an embarrassment to me because uh, I'm, uh, in my real life, uh, I'm as much involved in uh, our, uh, Irish history and literature as I am in Armenian history and literature. Uh, so therefore, I'm a little bit embarrassed that I'm standing here in, in black and blue rather than, rather than green. But um, maybe in this crowd, it's not as big a crime as it would be in, in other crowds. So we can get started. And um, I want to point out that bios for our superb presenters are available in the program. And our moderators won't be giving, uh, I trust, extensive introductions for each of the speakers in the interest of time. We will be asking, in fact imploring, maybe even commanding, uh, our speakers all to stick to, their, uh, to the time limit of, of uh, no more than 20 minutes to allow time for discussion. And I will ask also our moderators to uh, be ruthless but, but kind in, in uh, cutting them off. And just as a backup, I'm going to set a timer for 20 minutes for each speaker, and I'm going to be really obnoxious and let this play when 20 minutes are reached. Because Professor Hovanesian can't be here all day to loom over speakers and to cut them off, and I may not have the gravitas of Professor Hovanesian anyway, but I do have a cell phone, so uh, I, will, I will use what I've got. On that note, then, I want to uh, turn things over to the moderator for the first session, Arda Melkonian. And Arda is a doctoral candidate at UCLA, known to many of you here. I'm not going to give her an extensive introduction either, but we're very happy to have her here to, uh, to moderate the first session of speakers. So, Arda. Thank you, Mark. Good morning. It is wonderful to see all of you here this morning. And I would also like to extend a special welcome to those viewers who are watching live stream. We're so glad that you could join us. I have the honor of moderating the first panel and we have some excellent speakers. So without any further delay, I would like to get started with our first panelist. Our first speaker is Dr. Haik Demoyan. Dr. Demoyan is a Fulbright visiting scholar at Harvard University, and he is researching the identity transformation processes in the South Caucasus. Since 2006, he has been director of the Armenian Genocide Museum Institute in Yerevan. He is also the chief editor of the International Journal of Armenian Genocide Studies, and he has authored more than 40 academic articles and 12 books. Dr. Demoyan was born in Leninagan. He received his education from Yerevan State University and his Doctor of Historical Sciences from the Armenian National Academy of Sciences. Dr. Demoyan.
Bali Luis, uh, good morning. I have to confess that uh, uh, one of the challenges of my speech was how to make illustrations to my such abstract title, uh, return or stay. Well, it's a kind of abstraction, but I tried hard to check my hard drivers and find something which could be interesting and even you can read it, what I'm talking about. Well, this is a very sophisticated approach to my uh, presentation. And um, within 20 minutes, of course, I cannot cover this huge topic and abstraction kind of, yeah, and make some theories. Uh, but uh, I prefer to shift a, li a little bit uh, the attention on the topic uh, to the local media, not the Armenian media outlets uh, printed uh, in Polis or Izmirna, but what was the dis discourse in Harbert, in Sebastia, in Erzurum, talking about immigration. It was uh, like a uh, disease. It was considered as a tragedy before 1915 and between Adana. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm going to touch this issue a little bit later, but the background information as an introduction, uh, how Armenians appeared uh, in America, how this stream of uh, migrants moved from uh, Armenia proper, by the way, not only from uh, Western Armenia, but also Eastern Armenia, especially to California. This is also another interesting uh, story. Uh, I'm going to give a brief outline because this was researched very properly by many scholars, but the general trend was as follows. First arrivals were Armenian students, um, and uh, that con they, they were connected with American missionaries who launched their activities in Western Armenia, uh, first in Bolis, then moving uh, in Armenia proper. Uh, the main idea was to train them as minister, and after the education, uh, usually in Yale, Princeton, and other very well-known uh, Harvard uh, universities. Uh, it was designed that they would be back to uh, work as a minister and to work for uh, propagating um, uh, Protestantism in, uh, among the Armenians. Uh, but it appeared that uh, some students preferred to stay. They found a way to stay in, in the United States because, uh, well, it's individual choice, you know. Uh, when you feel uh, secure and you find different atmosphere rather than uh, in Armenia, which is a situation where it was absolutely non secure for uh, very well known reasons, so some of them uh, preferred to stay. And uh, some individuals also started in, uh, fir uh, from the first half of the 19th century, uh, moved somehow to the United States. Uh, we, we know names uh, of uh, people who had no money while moving to the uh, United States. They were servants or were accompanied by missionaries. And they found the ground uh, mostly on the East Coast and launched their activity. Some of them uh, really became very successful. Uh, the first billionaire story, uh, uh, millionaire story, Hagop uh, Borigian story, is amazing. I strongly recommend to read his memoirs. Uh, amazing experience. And. Um, Already in the late 19th century, uh, when the massacre started, this triggered a lot of Armenians uh, started to move, whole villages started to move to America, outside of Ar Armenia, first of all, but uh, the main destination was United States. Uh, poor people, even wealthy people, they moved they, with their businesses with some money. Um, uh, but uh, 1890s became, uh, landmark date when uh, most of Armenia started to move and it was, it was discussed already that uh, uh, Armenia is emptying. Well, the current discuss in Armenian newspapers, in diaspora and local Armenian is also uh, rising this issue. People leaving Armenia for, for us now, for what, for what reasons uh, people leave Armenia. Um, this is another story, not uh, connected or not with my topic, but I can also speak if you ask me questions. Uh, I'm a person who answers openly um, to any question. Um, Hamidian massacres, as I said, uh, triggered a huge stream of Armenians from Western Armenia. But what happened in Eastern Armenia, a uh, rel relatively secure atmosphere in the Tsarist Russia, is also an amazing story. 
uh, when a whole village next to the city I was born, uh, Alexandrapol, uh, Hazarapad village, uh, suddenly whole families decided to move to uh, United States because of some Russian sectants came and said, you know, why are you living here? Go to America. America is like a paradise. You have to go there. I don't know how this uh, worked. And one family moved to America. Then, as it appears in uh, many Armenian cases, whole village nearly started uh, to move towards America. But on wh which direction? Western Armenians knew the direction. The police, Izmir, then Marseille, then Hover, La Liverpool, then to uh, America. But for Eastern Armenian case, the situation was interesting. They moved to, uh, from the opposite direction. Caspian, Central I Asia, Siberia, Chukotka, then Alaska, from Alaska down to Canada. They uh, uh, stopped uh, for a while in Winnipeg. Can you imagine? So whole Chirag residents for a while <laughs> stop in a frozen place that called Winnipeg in Canada, and then they moved to California. Mostly they settled here. I was surprised really uh, when uh, uh, first I visited California in 2010 while working in a cemetery, I, I, I was amazed because it's a Chirac, Alexandra Paul, how it appeared to people here. Maybe there are uh, Second World War veterans, the uh, uh, POWs who moved with the allies to this uh, part. Then I realized there are a lot of women also. <laughs> and then uh, the story of uh, Shirak Armenians moved to America uh, became known to me. And it's a really amazing story how from different parts people moved to uh, America. Now, uh, the photo you see it's uh, amazing photo showing uh, 1895 dinner uh, served in uh, uh, Boston. Newly arrived Armenian uh, immigrants and Mofsez Gulesian actually sponsored this dinner. You can see mostly young capable men who arrived from Armenia for work to save money uh, to bring their families or uh, to stay in America or return back with some accumulated uh, money. You see few uh, women here, one seated on the left, but a couple of uh, standard, probably local, uh, uh, local women. But uh, you see 95% are men watching to the photo. Uh, what is interesting, when I put this picture uh, in a book, then after it was printed, I looked deep, and you can see the map in the background. There is a map hanged right over there. First I realized this is a curtain, by white curtain. Then I looked uh, closer, it appeared that this is a map. So uh, it looks like, I don't want to claim 100% not to, be, uh, to, to make a mistake, it looks like uh, it's a map of um, uh, Armenia, and there are some lines showing where from they are from what villages, Harbert, and it's, it's the central uh, part is Harbert, definitely. Uh, so more research and information we need why this map was put. Uh, probably it, it was some presentation, like I'm doing now, presentation who are uh, from which region or from uh, what village. So the general question is why and how uh, this man, first uh, immigrants were uh, men, of course, uh, then later on uh, families moved. They came with the ideas to accumulate money, but they had a lot of thoughts upon arrival to stay or to move back. Actually, this duality is also very fatal or crucial for current generation living in Armenia, especially for people who moved to Russia. The same thing also is ongoing. Some men were going for uh, temporary migrant works in Russia, Sometimes they make second families there living in Armenia, the initial families. And then it, you see uh, this dual life. One family in Armenia, they send money, but the second family, of course, mostly with the uh, uh, Russians. Uh, the same situation. And I, we can imagine that 100 and more years ago, men, while appearing in American uh, 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 in American uh, land and uh, settled in different countries, mostly in East Coast, they have the same thought. Going back to Armenia with Turkish cruelties, Kurdish uh, assaults, uh, many of them were uh, villagers, uh, to bring families 
And it was a huge distance. It was not, there was no plane that time. Uh, we can imagine, and uh, this could be a very uh, interesting topic for research, what kind of ideas were dominant that time, to stay or to return back. But some uh, uh, persons uh, decided to return back. Among them were intellectuals, you know, uh, those who returned unfortunately became victims of the genocide of 1915. Some people were successful businessmen, they took uh, some technologies, some knowledge back to Armenia, started successful businesses uh, in Ottoman Empire. But uh, chronologically, if you look, uh, it happened uh, between 1908 and Adana massacre. So the articles I'm going to show you shows the real atmosphere and the way of thinking between uh, young Turkish uh, revolution or coup d'etat and then uh, one year after Adana massacre happened. So this picture is uh, from 1895, the very time when Hamidian massacres were ongoing, but they arrived, uh, uh, it was not escaped, fortunately, uh, uh, definitely they uh, came to make some money and uh, sent their, to their families. Um, this, uh, Mark knows this page. Uh, some businesses established in the United States they printed the ads, the information about the business, uh, booklets, uh, uh, when they were incorporated, uh, what kind of instructions uh, to, uh, to what kind of instructions to follow while in America or after returning to Amer uh, Armenia. This is really amazing uh, uh, part from the Arad grocery. Mark Mamigonians and sisters uh, established that grocery back in 1910. Am I right? Uh, 1910, and Mark still uh, uh, holds uh, booklet, advertisements book booklet about the activities, about the goods uh, of Arad Grocery. But what is interesting, when first time he uh, showed me this booklet, the first page I, 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 I read, it, I was amazed. So this is instruction how to launch trade activity for Armenians in Armenian. So if you start uh, to, uh, to be, uh, if you want to be involved in the trade activity, so those are the instructions, how to accumulate money. But the most interesting uh, paragraph uh, is this one. It's, it says, Mi mornar kinet yev zavagneret voronc hairenik tohtuzadzis. Serpazam pardaganutun unis anons handeb, martkutuna aispeska pahanje. So do not forget about your children and women you left at homeland. So uh, it's really uh, emotion, very emotional. It's your holy duty uh, uh, to feel uh, responsibly towards them because humanity demands this. This is the real translation. So one paragraph shows that still it was prevailing that you have to work, you have to be successful, but do not forget about your responsibilities towards your families uh, left in a homeland. When um, 1908 uh, Young Turkish Revolution happened, many Armenians were excited. You know the story from Europe, from America. They s decided to return back because something changed. So there is a liberty, equality, brotherhood, etc. You know the story. I don't want to give the details. And uh, after 1908, some families, some men uh, moved to Armenia with the hope that new life started there. But Adana massacres, it was a huge blow. It was a really shock, big shock for uh, those returnees and the locals, of course, and discourse in Armenian media, in diasporan media, also local uh, Istanbul printed Armenian media and uh, local Armenian cities printed Armenian uh, media started to talk about uh, ad consequences of Adana massacres in very harsh way, by the way. I'm really surprised how censorship allowed to use that uh, labeling uh, uh, towards the Turks and Kurds because if you read uh, summer period articles of 1909, really it's hardworking, uh, high definition and uh, uh, very uh, uh, very hard works to uh, labeling Turks as uh, uh, massacre, always practicing massacres. So I'm, I'm going to show you uh, first 
um, article. If you, uh, if you see a uh, uh, newspaper, it's a 1914 article. It is uh, uh, one column on the left, it is in Western Armenian, but the second one, uh, which uh, tell the story, and actually not a story, but the statistics about the Armenians in uh, uh, America, it says Amer Armenians in America, a couple of numbers. It is in uh, Eastern Armenia, so it's a reprint from a Caucasus, one of Caucasus newspapers, reprinted in Erzurum-based uh, Alik newspaper. Um, it brings very interesting statistic data based on Amer Arme American sources, American official sources. How many people are from 1900s by 1913? Interesting source. And uh, it also brings a ratio between male and female uh, immigrants. Uh, but there are no analysis here, what is good to go to Amer uh, America or, or what is bad. The next articles already from Western Armenian uh, uh, case. For example, Yef, uh, Yeprat, Azgain, Giragan, Gidagan, Yef, Karakagan, printed in Harbert, the uh, editorial here, Met Panduchtnere. It's really emotional wording. If you can read uh, Armenian, it's only one page uh, I put. Uh, as I said, after Aden and massacres, always on the front pages, you can find the story uh, about the uh, emigrants, about the Panducht, about the Gachtagan. Uh, it was uh, one of the, num is an, um, one of the uh, important actual uh, topics discussed in the pages. By 1914, even, you can find the titles, please do not leave, Migenatze. So it, it was a big panic, it's a good word for the situation before 1915. It was really panic si uh, situation close to, the, uh, to be characterized as a panic because whole villages emptied. Uh, well, we can say that those who left were lucky enough, at least they survived because next year uh, genocide started. Um, another article I want to show, I don't know if there are people from Sebastia, Gachtoch uh, Baregam Nerus. This editorial on the front page points that the disastrous effect of immigration is that middle class is living. The analysis here says that poor people, they have no any uh, resources to move. Rich, they enjoy their life here. But the middle, young people, you know the echoes of the modern situation in Armenia. Young, educated, capable people leave the country. And he says, in order to develop country, we need those guys here. And this will have very severe con consequences for Armenia, for future uh, projects, our ideas uh, to develop Armenia, when the middle class and young uh, uh, contingent is leaving. OK, I, I have three minutes. Five articles, again, Sebastian Andranik newspaper, from American Armenian life, the situation of those who left Armenia. Very uh, dark colors. So I, I, I know that this was intentionally. Five editorials uh, in, in a Sebastian newspaper, it was aimed to blackmail the um, situation of our, our Armenians in America. So it was preventive measure to describe, so it's not a paradise, you imagine. The, hard, the life is very hard there. If you move there, no one is uh, embrace you and say, okay, I will give you money so uh, you will survive here. So series of articles were intended to prevent this uh, stream, to prevent Armenians to move uh, from villages and the cities of Western Armenia. Um, by the way, this uh, newspaper was possible to find in Vienna Mechitarist uh, uh, congregations library where the uh, richest and the largest Armenian periodical uh, collection uh, is uh, preserved there. Another uh, article from the Andranik uh, newspaper of Sebastia, it shows, well, it's a continuation, it's a fifth article actually. Uh, this is a very nice title. If you read uh, Guy Haik Nagachian from Philadelphia. The question is, Debi America te Hairenik. Look at the, the title. And again, I would like to read uh, this uh, paragraph and uh, 
finish my presentation. Հայրենիք նե որ զուրգ է շոկե կարգերը, էլեկտրակարգերը, էլեկտրագանությունը, հերաձայնը, մագնիսագանությունը եւ զանազան մեքենաները ուստի մի փն դրեք հաջողությունը հարստությունը ամերիկայի մեջ նա մարավանցա գործավարության ցանրատար խավերում մեջ որ դժվար է հաղթել այն ամերիկացին, ապրիկայի եւ ամորթներուն, իտալացին, ֆրանսացին, անգլացին, զվիցերիացին, սպանացին եւ զանազան ազգերուն, որոնք երբեմ են թեև լեզվով անգլախոս ինք զինքը կանվանեն ամերիկացի, ընկերանալով կկազմեն գործից գործիտ անդամներն է։ Ալ կրնա գերևագայել թե ողջապ դժվար պիտի լա հաղթել անոնց միայն ու միայն գործելով ուստի փոխանա գերազանքներով տարբերվելու ավելի լավ կլա հերատեսություն ու աշխատություն ունեցու գնդրելով հայկական կդուրին տակ ծլիլ ցաղգիլ ու իրեն իդեալին իրագործման ճանա So another call to stay um, few words and I'm finishing we have the same situation now Again, Armenia is emptying. It's, uh, I'm not uh, going to open secrets. We had the situation in Turkey. We know for, why, for what reason Armenians left for new life, for security. But now Armenians are also leaving for the same reason. That this time, we have problems not with uh, outside players or forces, but also things and problems we have inside. So let's read and talk about things which happened 100 years ago, but not to do the same mistakes in our days. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Demoyan, for this fascinating talk. I wish we had more time to hear about your research, but maybe during the question and answer we can ask some questions. Our next speaker is Dr. David Gutman. Dr. Gutman is Associate Professor of History at Manhattanville College in New York. He is currently finishing a book, Sojourners, Smugglers, and the State, Armenian Migration, Mobility Control, and Sovereignty in the Late Ottoman Empire, 1885 to 1915. The book will be out in 2019. Dr. Gutman will speak on Armenian migration to North America state power and local politics in the late Ottoman Empire. Dr. Gutman. Thank you, and <clears throat> I'm glad I'm going after Hike because uh, some of what I'll be talking about actually piggybacks exactly on what he was discussing. I'll be, can you hear me? I'm not used to using the microphone. Everybody can hear me? All right, great. Uh, so uh, I'll actually be talking about uh, the issue of return migration, especially uh, before the Young Turk era, so in the Hamidian era. And I wanted to start off with a little story that I hadn't planned to tell, but for reasons that will become clear, uh, I felt I needed to add to my talk. And that is uh, in April uh, of 1906, uh, Ohanis Topalian uh, showed up at the American consul, uh, consul's office in Sivas, Sebastia, uh, after uh, having returned from the United States in uh, 1901. When he returned, for, he had been in the United States, he had originally migrated in 1891. He returned 10 years later in 1901 to start a family. Uh, he showed up at the consul's office in, in Sivas in order to secure a passport to aid in both his and his young family's return back to the United States. Uh, the reason why this was of special importance for him is because it was uh, officially outlawed by the Hamidian regime for Armenians to migrate to the United States. So he was hoping to secure the assistance uh, of the United States uh, consular officials in Sivas to return uh, to uh, receive a passport so he could easily return to the United States with his family. This required that he could prove to the consular officials that he was uh, a naturalized American citizen. And this reminds me a little bit of uh, the talk, the keynote address uh, yesterday. There was this question about who is it, uh, who is an Armenian, and what defines Armenian identity. In this context, he was trying to prov uh, prove the inverse, right? Who is an American? 
And so he presented to the consular official in CWAS his uh, naturalization form that showed that he, in fact, had naturalized as an American citizen uh, in Providence, Rhode Island in uh, 1899, I believe. He also showed his U.S. Army discharge papers. Uh, Ohanis Topalian had served in 1898 in the Spanish-American War and was in fact decorated by uh, the state of Rhode Island for his military service. So he presented this uh, material to the American consul. And uh, to top everything off, to prove that to the American consul he was who he says he was, he performed drill for uh, the consular official, right? Drilling back and forth to demonstrate that he in fact had served in the United States Army and in the consul's report to the American legation in Washington, uh, excuse me, in Istanbul, he mentioned that, uh, that Ohanis Topalian had in fact performed drill quite admirably. Despite having all of this information, his request for a US passport was denied and he was refused uh, any assistance from the United States government as a citizen uh, of the United States. Uh, a year later, he pops up again in Alexandria, in Egypt, right, uh, at the U.S. consul in Alexandria, and he presents the same information to the U.S. consul in Alexandria and is again denied protection from the United States government. So the question is, how is this possible, right? He has legitimate naturalization papers, uh, he had served in the United States uh, Army, and in case there's any ambiguity about whether this is true or not, you can find Ohanis Topalian's picture right there uh, with his comrades in 1898. Uh, so and this is why I wanted to, uh, to include this story, because in fact his image is here. It's also in Hike's book. Uh, there, is a, there is a short page on uh, um, Armenian Americans who served in the Spanish-American War, and his picture and his medal from the state of Rhode Island are there. Right? So how does somebody who has this record, uh, how is he denied service? How is he denied protection uh, when he uh, appears in front of the U.S. Consul in Sebasti and Siwas? And the answer to this question goes uh, to the heart of the Armenian uh, mi migratory experience in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Because in fact, uh, Armenian migrants were migrating between uh, the Ottoman Empire and the United States are caught between the anti-immigrant policies of both the Ottoman government and the United States government. Uh, when Armenians start migrating in large numbers, to the United States beginning in the late 1880s. Uh, the regime of Sultan Abdul Hamid II uh, very quickly outlaws uh, Armenian, specifically Armenian migration to North America. From the perspective of uh, the Hamidian regime, uh, Armenian migration to North America is intrinsically linked with the emergence uh, of Armenian political organizations, the Hunchikyan uh, Revolutionary Party, the Tashnak Tsutsun, uh, and so therefore from the perspective of the Ottoman state, Armenians are migrating to the United States, their minds are being poisoned by these revolutionary ideas, and their plan is to return to the Ottoman Empire to sow discord. This is the, this is the language of, that the Ottoman state is using to, to justify this uh, prohibition against Armenian migration to North America. But as we know in the 21st century, when states put up obstacles to mobility, no matter where this is, on the Mediterranean, uh, along the Mexican-United States border, people find ways to bypass those prohibitions on mobility. And so too did Armenian migrants who developed these elaborate smuggling networks uh, that especially linked Harper to places as far afield as Mersin, uh, Samsun, uh, Beirut, uh, Latakia along the uh, Med eastern Mediterranean coast to smuggle Armenian migrants seeking to go to the United States out of the Ottoman Empire in spite of these uh, prohibitions on their mobility. And you can see some evidence of these networks. For example, Robert Myrak talks about this, uh, as does uh, Isabel Caprielian in her, in her work. You can find this in some of the, uh, also the memoirs of migrants like Boas uh, Jafarian and uh, Israel uh, Safarian, who also talk about their experiences uh, of migrating through these informal channels, trying to bypass these prohibitions uh, on leaving the Ottoman Empire. 
But it was equally outlawed for Armenians to return to the Ottoman Empire in the Hamidian era from the United States. Those who had migrated unlawfully uh, from the Ottoman Empire to the United States could not then return to their home communities. And as we see from, from Hayek's presentation, these implorations to return, not to forsake your family members, not to forsake, uh, not to forsake your home communities and your homeland, right? It was important, uh, even if it was only temporary, to return, to visit ailing families, to get married, to start families, perhaps to purchase a piece of land. And so despite the fact that it was outlawed to return to uh, these home communities, uh, they did so anyway through these same clandestine channels. Uh, this is what Ohanis Topalian uh, was forced to do in 1901. He uh, was forced when he returned from the United States to go to Alexandria to acquire an Ottoman mobility passport, essentially an internal passport, so that he could uh, return uh, through Izmir, Smyrna, posing as somebody who had, been migra who had been working in Alexandria, who had never traveled to the United States. And this is the reason why he was denied protection by the United States government. In the mid-1890s, during the height of the Hamidian massacres, uh, Armenians were still returning back to their home communities. These were especially prominent wealthy Armenians from these earlier generations of migrants, those who had migrated to receive education uh, and wanted to re and had the idea of when they had uh, set out to go to the United States to return. Uh, many of these Armenians, while they had been in the United States, had naturalized as American citizens. And at the height of the Hamidian massacres, as they're returning to the Ottoman Empire, they're being detained by Ottoman authorities uh, for the simple crime of presenting an American passport when they returned to uh, the Ottoman Empire. This caused a major diplomatic row between the United States and the Ottoman, uh, Ottoman government in the context of all of this press about the atrocities being carried out against Armenians in the Ottoman Empire that was showing up on the pages of the New York Times, uh, the Washington Post, the New York Herald. And so the United States government uh, pressured the Ottoman state not to detain, unlawfully detain, uh, American citizens uh, of Armenian descent who are uh, simply trying to return to their home communities uh, in the Ottoman Empire. This then, uh, so realizing that uh, the Ottoman state is in a difficult diplomatic position, the Ottomans essentially worked to sort of flip uh, the narrative uh, onto uh, and against Ar Armenian migrants because uh, the uh, Ottoman diplomatic staff in the United States was quite aware in the late 1890s coming into the first decade of the 20th century that there is mounting anti-immigrant discourse in the United States. Uh, this reaches a crescendo in 1901 when, a, uh, when an American citizen of Polish descent, Leon Czolgosz, who is also an anarchist, uh, assassinates the American president, William McKinley. Uh, the Ottoman state is pressuring, the Ottoman diplomatic officials in uh, the United States are pressuring the United States, saying, look, you have a problem with immigrants, with untrustworthy immigrants uh, in your own country. These Armenians who are returning to the Ottoman Empire are the same thing. We are dealing with the same issues. We are dealing with these troublemakers who come back to the Ottoman Empire to sow discord, uh, to practice revolutionary politics. And you in the United States are cracking down on immigration here. Why can't we do the same in our own country? And this argument worked. Uh, by the first uh, years of the 20th century, the United States actually began to agree, their policies began to align with that of the Ottoman Empire. That Armenians, who even those who had naturalized as American citizens, who returned to the Ottoman Empire should not be afforded the protections of American citizenship because, uh, as the language was used uh, by American officials, United States officials, these are not trustworthy citizens. Trustworthy citizens do not go back to their uh, home communities to sow political discord, right, to cause problems in their home communities. So therefore, uh, these returnees aren't worthy of protection as American citizens. And in fact, the decision for deciding who was, uh, who was eligible for protection and who was not was left to the consular authorities themselves, meaning essentially these consuls on the ground uh, are put in the position of deciding who deserves uh, who deserves protection as American citizens and who does not deserve uh, protection as American citizens. So to give you an idea, right, uh, these consuls essentially can decide to denaturalize 
uh, these migrants, essentially based on the information that they're collecting. Uh, the main issue here, what, what, uh, what uh, essentially creates uh, or what uh, targets an Armenian returnee for denaturalization is if they return to the Ottoman Empire posing as an Ottoman subject. Uh, the rub here is that the only way to return to uh, the Ottoman Empire in the Hamidian era was to pose as an Ottoman subject. If you came to the border, if you came to Samsun or Mersin saying you were an American citizen, then the, by Ottoman law you would be debarred from re-entering the Ottoman Empire. So the only way to go home was to uh, pose as an Ottoman subject or was to travel through these clandestine smuggling channels back to their home communities. So essentially, almost all Armenian returnees in the uh, Hamidian era uh, were, who had naturalized as American citizens, were in this category uh, of people who would essentially not be afforded the protections of citizenship because they had returned uh, to their home communities through these channels, right? And, thus explaining why Ohanis Topalian, despite the evidence that he has, despite the fact that he had a distinguished service record in the Spanish-American War, was denied protection as an American citizen, both by the American consul in Sebastia and then later uh, in, in Alexandria in Egypt. Uh, after the 1908 uh, Young Turk Revolution, uh, these prohibitions on mobility were lifted, both on out-migration and return migration. And so for several years after 1908, uh, this problem seemed to have been resolved. It was no longer uh, Armenians could return, for example, to the Ottoman Empire with an American passport and not necessarily face debarment. Uh, this seemed to no longer be a major issue, of course, until 1915 and the genocide. Uh, and for those of you who have read uh, the accounts, for example, uh, of uh, Leslie Davis, who was the consul, American consul in Harpert in 1915, uh, who famously wrote uh, what becomes known as the Slaughterhouse Province, uh, talks about uh, Armenians, both uh, the family members of, Ar uh, of American citizens, Armenian American citizens living in the United States, as well as Armenians who had returned, uh, especially before 1908, seeking assistance in the context of the genocide in 1915 from the American uh, consul in Harpert and him, Leslie Davis essentially having to de deny these protections uh, because, again, these laws, these provisions still applied, that those who had returned uh, to their home communities uh, would not be afforded the protection of American citizenship. So even in the context uh, of the genocide, this became an important question. And in the aftermath of the genocide, the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and the emergence of the Turkish Republic, uh, Taner Aksham and Umit Kurt in their recent uh, work on uh, the spirit of the laws uh, talks about these efforts by the Turkish Republic uh, in the 1920s to develop a legal system that essentially would prevent Armenians from returning uh, to their home communities and uh, claiming land that had been taken from them, properties that had been taken from them uh, during the genocide. And, uh, part of this legal system, these set of laws that emerge in the 1920s, it rests upon these practices that emerged during the Hamidian era of uh, essentially denying uh, uh, American, those who had naturalized as American citizens from returning to the Turkish Republic. So essentially they borrowed from this Ottoman, from this Hamidian era practice uh, to ensure that Armenians, especially those who had naturalized as American citizens, could not return to Turkey to pursue claims on lost properties uh, and lost lands. So this practice from the Hamidian era actually carries over uh, into the Turkish Republic and becomes a key uh, part of how the Turkish Republic prevents Armenians from returning and laying claims uh, to lost properties and lost lands. But this isn't just an Armenian story, this isn't just an Ottoman story, uh, this is also an American story, right? Because what allows the Ottoman Empire to make what allows the Ottoman state and automatic, uh, Ottoman diplomatic officials to make a successful case that uh, the U.S. government should not recognize the citizenship status of these returnees is uh, essentially uh, employ is, is, is making a claim based on these anti-immigrant politics that are emerging in the United States uh, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, right? Using this as, as, as justification 
for why the United States government should see these returnees as somehow less than American citizens, somehow uh, not worthy uh, of, the, of support and protection uh, of American citizenship, right? It was essentially the anti-migrant discourses of both the Ottoman state and the United States government that makes this possible. And I will say as, as uh, a last point, uh, that my book that should be coming out uh, in, uh, in early 2019 that won't have that mouthful of a title, they're going to make me change it, that's the way it works, uh, is going to be focused on, in part on how the Armenian migratory experience in the late 19th and early 20th centuries also parallels uh, the experiences of contemporary migrants. Uh, we're seeing in the 21st century how uh, anti-immigrant politics, militarization of borders, uh, and securing of borders is creating this dangerous atmosphere for migrants to move across borders, and uh, increasingly dangerous to the point where for many migrants in the 21st century, uh, it's a life or death experience. Uh, because the technologies of the late 19th and early 20th centuries were not as powerful as they are today, uh, the Armenian migratory experience migrating through these informal channels was not quite as dangerous as it is in the early 21st century. Nonetheless, the experiences of uh, Armenian migrants seeking both to leave the Ottoman Empire and to return to the Ottoman Empire in the face of these prohibitions uh, provides us with some degree of historical context for what we're seeing in the present and for how uh, the politi anti-migrant politics, anti-immigrant politics can create this dangerous situation, can create a situation in which those who are moving across borders are put in this very, very vulnerable situation. Right? And this would, of course, have a special consequence for those Armenians who returned in the Hamidian era, and then again uh, for the fate of those who were caught up in the genocide in 1915 and in its aftermath. And I'll be glad to explore any of these issues in greater depth during the question and answer period, but my time is up. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gutman, for this very interesting talk. Our next presenter is Dr. Ben Alexander. Dr. Alexander received his PhD in history from the City University of New York Graduate Center in 2005. He is currently working on uh, trans uh, publishing his dissertation. He has published articles and two other books. He currently teaches American history and government at the New York City College of Technology. He will speak to us today about the Armenian American community and the paradox of, of partisanism. So I would like to invite Dr. Alexander. My research makes me something of a fly in the ointment at an event like this because largely as a function of what source material I've been able to get my hands on, it emphasizes that aspect of the Armenian American experience that so many prefer not to hear about, the partisan schism between the Armenian Revolutionary Federation or Tashnag Party and the coalition of non-Tashnag parties, especially the Ram Gavars. It comes naturally to many in looking at the schism especially when the tension involved riots, fistfights, and the murder of an archbishop, to see the whole thing in terms of a missed opportunity for unity and greater strength, to see it in terms of what didn't happen. My own approach does not necessarily contradict or refute that, but as a historian, I prefer to get beyond the dimensions of whether something was a good thing or a bad thing and just consider the thing on its own terms, reconstructing how and why the thing happened as it did. To state the obvious, Armenians are not the only ethnic group in America that has had internal dissension. In the early 1920s, there was a bitter and very public animosity between two black leaders, W.E.B. Du Bois and Marcus Garvey, who represented two conflicting visions of black identity in America. Du Bois's was of integration, calling upon African Americans to claim their rights as Americans, while Garvey called upon his black constituents to root their sense of identity in the imagined African state that he intended to create and lead. 
Each of these men represented an organization that depended on membership dues and that published a newspaper that depended on subscriptions. Thus, there was a marketing element involved, the marketing of ideas about group identity, of membership in an organization, and newspapers. And that's pretty much the dynamic I'm talking about here with Armenians. For much of the 20th century, the Armenian press in America was controlled by the parties, and a huge part of their editorial content was taken up by accusations of bad faith between Tashnag and non-Tashnag leadership cadres. The news coverage also had readers living in two different realities. During World War I, when the Tashnag party founded and held majority control over an independent republic in eastern Armenia, in the Tashnag press, that republic was the embodiment of Armenia. In the non-Tashnag press, the republic was just barely relevant. After the collapse of the republic and the creation of the Soviet Armenian state, the competing presses rehearsed the contested memories of those years with no let up in the acrimonian finger pointing. In 1933, those contested memories provided the context for a fresh new contested memory when Archbishop Leon Turian in July ordered the removal of the Republic's tricolor flag from the World's Fair stage in Chicago where he was to speak and was murdered in church the following December with nine Tashnag Armenians tried and convicted in the months that followed. On the pages of the competing partisan presses between 1918 and 1933, one gets more than a clue to why when the events of 1933 unfolded the Tashnogs and the anti-Tashnogs saw two completely different realities playing out based on what they remembered and had been constantly reminded of in the press. A side note, one thing that was different during the World War I years from later is that Armenian political leaders back then kept the fighting contained in the family. They spoke with one voice to world powers while ripping each other to shreds on editorial pages that only Armenians could read. Throughout the Soviet years, as is well known, the substance of the partisan contention was over whether to accept or reject Soviet rule over the small eastern slice of the historic homeland that could still be called Armenia. From the 1920s onward, the Tashnag press called on its readers to feel a sense of identity as a people whose homeland was under enemy occupation, while the Ramgavar press gave the sense of a homeland that was under temporary and friendly guardianship. Sense of identity is key here, and with that comes the function that ethnicity serves in people's lives. That's particularly notable in the 1930s when the Tashnag and Ramgavar parties were forming youth clubs to keep the second generation involved. For the Ramgavars, both the homeland and the ethnicity had much more of an optional and comforting quality to them, while in the Hyrenic press, both involved a sense of struggle. In parallel with the sociological terms challenge religion and comfort religion, I apply the terms militant ethnicity versus celebratory ethnicity. Consistent with this, it was in the Tashnag's Hyrenic Weekly in the 1930s that one found a series of articles and letters spanning several weeks on um, the question of whether marriage to non-Armenians was a threat to the, quote, race. The contributors, the contributors disagreed on whether it was or wasn't, but the question was much likely to arise at all in the Ramgavar press. For all their differences, partisan leaders in the United States agreed that they wanted Armenian immigrants and their descendants to be loyal to America and upwardly mobile in the American economy. This was not mere lip service. When Armenian spokespersons lobbied US government officials for policies favorable to Armenia and unfavorable to Turkey, it was always to their advantage to be able to point to what good patriotic Americans their constituents were. Because they needed Armenians in America to donate money to homeland-related causes, they also had every good reason to want their community to be well positioned in the American economic structure. And it should be noted that Armenians enjoyed substantial middle-class upward mobility in the 20th century. After World War II, there was much movement from urban enclaves to more residential sections of cities and the surrounding suburbs. The partisan press encouraged upward mobility and achievement in mainstream American contexts. 
The papers celebrated Armenian students' accomplishments in the American schools, proudly announcing who had become editor of a yearbook or won a music competition. That leads me to clarify my use of the word marketing. Marketing does not, from my point of view, mean manipulating people into doing what they would not otherwise want to do. Rather, every bit as much as it involves exerting influence, it entails learning what people's situations and needs are and meeting them. Armenian Americans, especially the generations born in America, were Americans. That was the reality. And the Armenian institutions, including the parties and the newspapers they published, fully encouraged this reality while calling upon their constituents to maintain their sense of Armenianness in tandem. By the 1950s, the presses frequently referred to their readers as Americans of Armenian descent. Significantly, the parties in the 1950s also found ways to call each other bad Americans as well as bad Armenians. What was more, the Armenian experience was something that could be shared with fellow Americans. That included books like Marjorie Hovsepian's A House Full of Love about life in an Armenian household in the 1920s, and the music of composer Alan Hovanes, which updated ancient uh, sacred Armenian sounds for modern day sensibilities. It also included celebration of the success of certain prominent Armenians in the big leagues of the American mainstream, uh, like film director Ruben Mamoulian, painter Ashil Gorky, and playwright and novelist William Soroyan. After World War II, when the tensions of the Cold War um, reached a climax of dominance in the political culture of the American host society, the Tashnag Party capitalized on the opportunity to make Armenian nationalism and American patriotism not only compatible but synonymous. Party leaders in the United States, who were by and large the editors of the Hyrenique Press, made use of all available photo ops with cold warriors in Congress and played up the language of Armenian national liberal liberation. There was little actual strategy for liberating Armenia from Soviet rule, but party leaders strove to keep their constituents mindful that they had a homeland that needed liberating. And where does the genocide come in amid all this? First of all, the word itself came into existence in 1943 when it was coined by Raphael Lemkin. At that point, right away, the mass murders of Armenians by the Young Turk regime during World War I were recognized as an example of the crime of genocide, both by Armenians and by the promoters of the United Nations Genocide Convention, a worldwide treaty drafted after World War II. From there, it still took a couple more decades for the word to become fixed as the one and only proper name of a coherent event. But already, right after World War II, came the first books recounting the events of 1915 Turkey. Leon Sermelian's I Ask You Ladies and Gentlemen was published in 1945. George Mardikian's Song of America followed a decade later. These books, I should add, also came in the category of Armenians talking to their non-Armenian neighbors as well as to each other. Right along, there had been commemorations of April 24th as Martyrs' Day and of particular episodes of Armenian bravery, such as the defense of Van. But what took some evolution was what I call the naming and claiming of the genocide as a unified, coherent, singular event and the accompanying demand that no term other than genocide be used. In the 1950s and 1960s, one regularly heard Armenians referring to it as Mez Yagern, a term that Armenians tend to call an unacceptable euphemism now. But by the early 1960s, the notion of commemoration of the genocide, called precisely that, was in the language. 1965 was a major landmark when it came to the naming and claiming of the genocide, as it was the 50th anniversary. The central committees in Beirut of the three major Armenian political parties, Tashnag, Ramgavar, and Hunchak, issued a joint statement agreeing that the partisan infighting should be suspended while this anniversary was being commemorated. And for the most part, the press in the United States cooperated. A decade later, the three major parties went even farther and held a combined commemoration for the 60th anniversary. The churches, that is the affiliates of the diocese and the prelacy, 
did not go so far as to merge their own commemorations, but in the several years prior, at the local level, this is early 1970s I'm talking, without, uh, even without hierarchical approval, there were already some combined church observances. How did this become possible? Was it Armenians finally realizing that it was better to be unified and that their real enemy was Turkey? That was part of it. But some other factors were working to dilute the power of partisanism in the community. Ironically, one of the factors affecting the decline of partisanism was a new kind of division. In 1965, Congress passed the hart seller Act, which totally revamped the immigration laws. For Armenians, this meant a fresh influx of sons and daughters of Ararat coming into their communities, dramatically altering their cultural character and challenging the authenticity of their Armenianness. Armenian cultural institutions, especially churches, became meeting grounds, at times battlegrounds for the old line Armenians, including immigrants from years back and their descendants, and the new immigrants from the Middle East. As one, side, as one sign of the new cultural divide, in Watertown, Massachusetts, as the prelacy affiliated, and thus Tashnag dominated St. Stephen's Church began filling up with new immigrants from Syria and Lebanon, a number of parishioners started going to St. James Church, which was diocese affiliated, that is, non-Tashnag. The need for cultural similarity thus surpassed the need for partisan agreement, not a pattern that would have been foreseen decades earlier. Closely related was a shift in the way that Armenian observers spoke of the political parties. There was now a greater tendency to use that plural phrase, the political parties, to refer to a collectivity with attributes of its own and to defend that collectivity against critics. Representative of this shift was an article by Nubar Dorian that ran in the Armenian Reporter late in 1974. It is sad to behold, Dorian wrote, that a large segment of the Armenian community characterizes the person who belongs to a political party as a fanatic, a fool, a fantasizer. Yes, he conceded some party men pursue power and sow discord, but still the future of the Armenian American community would have been bleak indeed without the invigorating presence of the political parties. The novelty lay in the notion that one could speak of the parties together as opposed to one or another specific party as an entity to praise or critique. Ironically, though this piece appeared in the Armenian Reporter, the appearance of that paper itself was a factor in the decline of partisanism because it rose as a major Armenian-American newspaper that did not have a party affiliation that was competing with the ones that did. Alongside these changes in the United States, the parties at the global leadership levels were changing their approach. In December 1972, the ARF at the 20th World Conference in Vienna passed a series of resolutions shifting the focus of its enmity from the Soviet Union to Turkey and calling for an Armenian cultural revival throughout the diaspora with demands for recognition of the genocide as a major component. Three years later, the central committees of the parties in Beirut um, started working together to keep the Armenian community as a whole from becoming unduly caught up and divided in the civil war that broke out in Lebanon. All of this coincided with and reinforced the large amount of activity worldwide that brought Armenian indignation against Turkey into sharper and more articulate focus. Protests directly aimed at Turkish consulates became more frequent in the 1970s. Also in 1972, the Armenian Assembly of America was founded. Its mission included bringing conflicted segments of the Armenian community together under one umbrella, promoting cultural identity within the diaspora and political lobbying. Certain events involving Turkey energized the cause. Armenians found themselves running up against evidence that the United States and some world institutions were afraid of, attending, of offending the Turkish government. For example, in April of 1971, plans had been made for the U.S. Marine Band to perform at a Martyrs' Day commemoration in Montebello, California, but then their performance was canceled. And there were other such instances in both the 60s and 70s. Armenians had always shared indignation at Turkey and at U.S. foreign policies that favored Turkey, but there was greater focus now. 
In September of 1974, the central committees of the Tashnag, Ramgavar, and Hunchag parties issued a joint appeal to all Armenians from Beirut, declaring that the time has come to present a united front to the world on the occasion of the 60th anniversary of the genocide executed on the Armenians. The statement, which included a demand for territorial sessions from Turkey, called it important that no government may use our internal differences as an occasion to ignore the voice of the Armenians. Um, that December, the American centers of the same three parties echoed the appeal. Uh, the editorial page of the Armenian Weekly, formerly Hyrenic Weekly, declared, it was high time that all Armenians said to one another, hey, listen, I'm a Dashnag, you're a Ramgavar, or you're a Hunchak, but what difference does this really mean in terms of the great wrong? The rise of genocide consciousness and the decline of partisanism did not happen in a straight line, though. Ironically, the rise of genocide consciousness in the 1970s actually stimulated a phenomenon that revived the partisan tensions, the emergence of terror networks carrying out assassinations of Turkish officials, with one such group apparently being founded by the ARF itself. While Armenians had no trouble agreeing that the genocide had occurred and that the Turkish government should face consequences for it, they could by no means agree that this gave present-era Armenians the right to assassinate contemporary Turkish officials. The result was renewed partisan tensions in the 1980s, and the commemorations of the 70th anniversary in 1985 were separate again. Even so, the 1970s represented a turning point for the longer run. Um, the focus of indignation came to be decreasingly fellow Armenians, increasingly the nation state of Turkey and its denial that its forebears had perpetrated a genocide. Today, I think, in fact, many in the young generations of Armenians don't even know much about the schism, though they certainly do know about the genocide. In fact, while there's cause for complaint that our high officials hesitate to use the word, in much of the literate American mainstream, the word has gotten so ingrained, so associated with Armenians, that on more than one occasion when I've told someone that my research is on Armenians or Armenian-American immigrant experiences, the same person soon after introduces me to someone with the words, I'd like you to meet Ben Alexander. He's writing a book about the Armenian genocide. But when it comes to the earlier years, while it makes sense to lament the partisan schism and wish there'd been unity instead, faithfulness to the task of historians to reconstruct and analyze the past as it happened necess necessitates that we probe its dynamics and its turning points on their own terms, even to the point of seeing the functions that it served for the ethnic institutions that were working together to keep themselves in existence by competing for the allegiance of constituents. Thank you. Okay, so we have 15 minutes for Q&A, and I would ask the audience to resist the urge to give speeches, please, just questions. <laughs> Are there any questions? Uh, thank you for three really excellent presentations. Uh, Dr. Alexander, you gave such a comprehensive coverage of uh, uh, the history of the American Armenian community, why did you leave out uh, the first assassination that took place here in California? You didn't name it specifically. Uh, and uh, second, I just want to make one short comment. The policy of the United States government with respect to naturalized citizens has never changed over the last hundred years. That is to say, if I'm a Chinese citizen, 
former Chinese citizen, naturalized, my government, the United States government, will not protect me in China. And that used to be stated clearly, but now it's more tacit. So everyone who has ever come from another country to the United States and becomes naturalized, your government will not protect you in the country of your origin. Well, the answer to your question to me is very easy. The answer to the, your question to me is that the event that you mention is one of the many things that I trimmed out of this talk in order to bring it down to the 20-minute the limit because it, the, the form that it was in when I got off the plane would have been closer to 35 or 40 minutes. So, simple answer to that. So there's a slight difference. I mean, in the Ottoman Empire, of course, is the capitulations that give extraordinary privileges to, um, to American citizens as well as to other Western citizens in the Ottoman Empire, which is a big reason why uh, the Ottoman state was interested in keeping out, um, um, keeping out uh, Armenian returnees who had naturalized as American citizens. And uh, the, the United States government was giving protections to um, especially to the family members of, uh, of American, naturalized American <coughs> citizens who were living uh, in the United States who, through at the time, citizenship law, were, were citizens by the fact that their fathers or their spouses were, were American citizens. Um, over here. Um, this is directed primarily to Dr. Alexander. Uh, uh, I'm in the weird situation of now being old enough to experience some of the stuff you discussed, the novelty. And speaking as such, there's uh, something I want to present and I'd like your reaction to it. And I think one other ingredient that was missing was in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and speaking as someone who was in the, on the East Coast in the 70s and 80s, the role of the flag, the, the tri I mean, tricolor as a divisive issue, despite that unifying trend. Uh, I wonder if you could speak to that, but primarily when I was in college, this is in Philly, one thing I realized there, and I've seen nothing since to challenge that first multi-year impression, is that, and speaking as a Tashnag, our side of the community tended to be more informed in general of various issues of all sides and things Armenian than the other side, and particularly it seemed to me like there was an imposed ignorance on people who are my age peers about the Republic period and so forth. Did you encounter anything like that? Did you have any thoughts on that? That's my primary question. The other one's secondary. Thank you. Okay, well, um, if, I, if I really try to address that question, I'll be giving a, a, a whole second paper because there's loads, there's loads to say on that, just, just in the sense um, when, it, when, it comes, when it comes to the Republic, um, during the years that the Republic was in existence, um, the Tashnag press um, really emphasized the Republic as being Armenia. Um, the non-Tashnag press barely mentioned its existence at all. Um, and in, in, the years, in the years after the Republic, in the, um, in the non-Tashnag press, like in the Mirror Spectator, um, you can find histories of Armenia that do not mention the Republic at all. So absolutely, absolutely, they, they, they were in parallel universes. And when it, comes, when it comes to the significance of the tricolor, the whole time that there was a Soviet Armenian state, um, from the point of view of the non-Tashnag coalition, um, the use of the tricolor represented a gesture, an unfriendly gesture to the Soviet Union that non-Tashnag Armenians didn't wish to make. That was, that was why Archbishop Turian in July of 1933 ordered the removal of the tricolor from the stage of the, of the World's Fair. Um, and so yeah, um, we are talking parallel universes um, and, and absolutely it was, it was very easy for non-Tashnags to um, not know much about the, um, the, um, the Republic because the, the Republic was largely a non-entity in the non-Tashnag press during the time that it existed. 
even while, again, it was Armenia in the Tashnag press. And by the way, um, I, I, I don't make any royalties off this, so there's no, no, nothing self-serving here. I do, I do have a full-length journal article um, on precisely what I've just summarized in the, uh, in the last two minutes. Thank you. Those were wonderful presentations. Well, I, I, just, I just want to add some uh, 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 important moments, putting the issue on, on a uh, larger context. 1933, when uh, in December this uh, assassin assassination occurred. Let's not forget that 1933 is an uh, important uh, date for Soviet-American relations also. First time both countries established bilateral relations. But before that, starting the, from the very moment of Sovietization of Armenia, hundreds of Americans were on the territory of Soviet Armenia, working as uh, relief workers. It was a unique case when uh, countries didn't recognize each other, there, are, there were no uh, diplomatic relations, but hundreds of citizens, uh, United States citizens, worked as relief workers, not only in Armenia, by the way, there was also Russian relief. Americans were involved that time. So it also uh, makes a uh, case interestingly, bringing it out of uh, Armenian uh, context. It's also between two uh, countries. I'm sorry for interrupting. Uh, those were wonderful presentations, thank you. I have a question uh, about what we hear from millennial age Armenians in this country, from all different countries, they've come here from different countries, they have different partisan affiliations, different religious backgrounds and beliefs, but the, the same question emerges, at least in my own and some of my friends' experiences talking with them, they want unity. They want uh, effectiveness of the community. They, they are interested in effective organization of the Armenian diaspora for success, and, and they define that economically, politically, socially, in, in different ways. My question is, do you see, and you may or may not, um, implications or possibilities as you study the history, as you study the dynamics, as you study the transitions, do you see evidence that there are tools, trends, uh, community characteristics that will contribute to the unity, effective organization, and effective advocacy for Armenian concerns in your work? Can you forecast based on what you've studied? Are there uh, enduring trends in resourcefulness, inventiveness, resilience that you see that might be, might give young millennials hope as, you know, for the Armenian community. I hope I've been articulate. I actually think you're probably the best person for that question. May I pass it to you? I, I have no idea myself. Maybe there's nothing. It's glorious. Yeah, yes, that, that, is, that is exactly it. I, I myself am purely a historian, and my whole context for researching the subject has been um, the context of American immigrant history for earlier in the century. So I, I, think, I think it's an excellent question, and I'm sure that there are people in the room who can give it excellent answers. I'm not one of them, though. Uh, it's yours. Okay, I am not a kamikaze, but uh, uh, but since I printed an article on that very topic, you uh, asked a question in the Mirror Spectator last September. Uh, I I printed an article about the crisis of the Armenian world, so I extended the issue, uh, bring the bring the problem not in the American Armenian context, but the broader pr uh, context. What is Armenian world, in, including Armenia, Artsakh, and diaspora? And I, like one gentleman 100 years ago said in French, j'accuse, I accuse, uh, I accuse the Armenian leadership elite, both in Armenia and uh, diaspora, for the situation we have now. And this is really crisis. I don't want to go deep, this is a long talk about this. Just to read my uh, article, my suggestion is to understand even partially uh, why I'm thinking that way. Uh, secondly, 
we have if some of uh, you wants to come to Fresno for my presentation, this is what about in terms of culture markers, why we are in a crisis. And I show beautiful images showing that very evidence of that crisis, because my study here in, at Harvard is about uh, ethnic transformations. A part of that research is I'm showing the diaspora and Armenian situations, why we have dualities and multiplities in terms of identities and interpretations, even interpretation of our past. Some of past belongs to the one group, to the other group. There are interpretations of current realities. We have even problem in a, a textbook writing because we distort history, we distort our memory. And uh, my personal opinion is that since we have two churches and still we have political parties in diaspora, I don't know, uh, can we claim that we are the second effective lobby in the United States, as it was said in the movie yesterday. I don't think so. Uh, th th thank you. Uh, my question is for David. Um, you talk about the clandestine migration um, routes prior to 1908, and I'm curious, uh, were those also organized by the political parties, like the Dushnak and the Hunchak parties, I, the reason why I ask that, because um, those parties saw the early immigrants as a source of funds. Um, even though they were factory workers, they didn't make much money, but still the United States was seen as a place where the, the, the revolutionary parties could get funds to, to help their brethren back in Armenia. So I don't have any evidence that the parties are directly involved in organizing these smuggling networks, but I do have uh, the, the characters that rise to the top are people who are stationed both, especially in Harpert, and then also uh, on the United States side. So uh, one, one well-known name that, that I think is well-known to, to Armenians from Worcester, for example, is uh, the Nahigian family. So Gaspar Nahigian, for example, uh, Mardaros Nahigian. Uh, in the early, late 1880s, early 1890s, they are kind of the migrant kingpins, uh, both on both sides uh, in the Harpet region and then also uh, in the Northeast. Uh, later in the first decade of the 20th century, uh, this person uh, rises to the top, Artin Harputlian, who is uh, a very, very prominent, wealthy banker who's actually uh, heavily involved also in uh, local governing structure. So he's a member, for example, uh, of the provincial, uh, pr provincial board, uh, provincial council, the Ottoman provincial council in Mamre Tulaziz, where, where Harbert is located. Uh, so, uh, and in fact, would have been an opponent of, uh, of the political parties. So, um, and they're making huge amounts of money off of, off of this migration industry. It's extremely lucrative. Uh, and to the extent that after 1908, uh, Artin Harputlian eventually goes bankrupt, I think because he loses, because now with migration being legal, he loses the money that he was making off of, um, off of, off of organizing these clandestine migration routes. Uh, one question that I have that, that links back to some of what, what, what Hayek is finding is there seems to be a conflict within the Armenian elite in the Harpert region. Uh, those like Artin Harputlian who are benefiting off of this migration industry and then those like, for example, the, Fabri the, the Fabricatorian brothers uh, who are trying to build sort of like an indi indigenous industrial base within Harpert who seem to be increasingly opposed uh, to, to migration uh, because of what it means for the local and regional economies. And, and that's what I would like to sort of tease out in a later research project is, is, is the kind of political context uh, in which, and the factions that are emerging in this region based around migration and, and developing these sort of uh, indigenous industrial and economic bases. Uh, thank you all for your excellent presentations. And I have a question for, for Haig. In light of what David spoke about in his talk that the Armenians who came to the United States were prohibited by law from returning. How much was this issue of legality uh, discussed in the newspaper articles uh, wrestling with the issue of whether to go back or not? Was it just an issue of uh, the, the patriotic pull of going back, or were the legal issues and the ramifications 
of going back debated in these articles also? Uh, well, I have a very simple answer to that question. I never saw yet any uh, evidence of uh, discussion or out media outlet on that given specific topic. So if any will be, I will just keep you updated. This is an excellent symposium. I love everything you guys said. My question is, my curiosity actually, and I have two questions. My, one is a curiosity. Mr. Alexander and Mr. Goodman, uh, I'm just curious if you are part Armenian or Armenian, and if you're not, what made you uh, uh, study the Armenian cause and the Armenian history throughout uh, the 19th and 20th century? And the second question is to Mr. Des Moines. I'm just curious uh, if you know, uh, at your last year, I don't remember his name, we're talking about the 400 years history of uh, Armenian Americans in, in this country. Uh, there was uh, a story about during the Civil War, there was an Armenian soldier uh, taking the north side and he's buried in, outside Philadelphia, and I don't remember his name. I don't know if this is true or false. Um, I'm just curious if Mr. Des Moines knows that. Thank you. Yeah, my, my father's family was Armenian. My last name, Alexander, is anglicized from Iskenderian. Um, but I, I, didn't, I didn't grow up knowing anything about Armenianness other than that Inchkuzes meant, what do you want? Uh, as, a matter, as a matter of fact, for many years, I also thought that Oigavolt was an Armenian word. Uh, but um, it, was, it was a choice of a dissertation topic when I needed one. Well, it's a perfect seed because my father's family is Jewish, my mother's family is Irish Catholic. Uh, so a nice mix, but no, no Armenian. Um, uh, interest was um, in, uh, I developed an interest in the Armenian genocide uh, as part of a course on genocide at the University of Minnesota when I was an undergraduate there. Uh, and uh, it just happened to be at the time that Taner Akcham was working, was at, was, was at the University of Minnesota. So uh, I got interested in kind of the context, the genocide's context within broader Ottoman history. And uh, I went to, uh, to SUNY Binghamton to study Ottoman history and found these wonderful materials in the uh, US archives about Armenian migration, wanted to study that further. And then uh, most of my source base is from the uh, Prime Ministry Ottoman Archive in Istanbul. So this is mostly Ottoman sources that are talking about uh, this migration. So I come at it from a somewhat of a different route, but um, uh, you know, I think it's centrally important both to you know, Armenian history, Ottoman history, and American history. Um. To answer uh, to your question, I just want to check. Uh, you asked about the First World War, but probably will be Civil War. Civil War. Yeah, it's well, well known. I, I have a story in a book. Uh, uh, recently, quite recently, the grave of Garabedian, who served on uh, USS Geranium, actually was the first Navy man, in, uh, Armenian Navy man in the United States, is mentioned, and uh, there are pictures in, in a book. Yeah, and uh, it's interesting that people still uh, track and find and clean uh, uh, of dust, uh, of the history, graves of those first early Ar uh, American Armenians who left their legacies is important, and this is the, uh, a book about. So we have to track and find the final race they found in this American soil in order to make a memorial sites. It's important to educate kids and the future generations about the uh, legacies and the heritage left. Thank you. Again, thank you so much uh, for your excellent presentations, uh, which educated us in depth for the first time. Question I have, knowing that unity brings greater benefits than disunity, and the example of another ethnic group in this country and in the world who planned with unity to have Israel in 1948, a 100 years before that. Do you think it's time for us to plan something similar uh, to achieve this 
unity with its greater benefits. Thank you. Okay. By default, of course I have to answer. <laughs> you mostly are citizens of the United States. I'm a citizen of the Republic of Armenia. You are proud of that, being Armenian and citizens of the United States. I'm proud of being Armenian, being citizen of the Republic of Armenia. But I love to quote what you read every time on banknotes or everywhere in a Latin, a pluribus union. Strength is in union. So it's very high time to learn and repeat every morning for every Armenian. It doesn't matter what kind of church he goes and prefers and what politi political party member he is involved. So this is question, this is a motto, strong, a short one, but a strong one. We have to follow to this. I th thank you both. Thank you uh, for these great speeches, for these great lectures. Um, I, this question is directed to Dr. Gutman. Um, it's non-Armenian related, mm -hmm. but I'd like to know, considering now we have a bit more insight on Armenian migration from the US to, uh, to the Ottoman Empire and vice versa, uh, what about, the first thing that came to my mind was, a, like, was, a le like was the Lebanese diaspora. Which had a which is a ma which had a major wave outside of Lebanon, and which is probably the first Ottoman diaspora that is quite large outside uh, that that region. Did they have a similar reality to the Armenians, even though they had earlier migrations? And in the meantime, uh, no. So and and a lot of this has to do with the uh, you know specificity of the Armenian experience in the late Ottoman Empire, and uh, so the. Uh, up until the mid-1890s, Lebanese migration was technically outlawed by the Ottoman state. Uh, by the late 1890s, uh, the Ottomans give approval for, for Lebanese to migrate uh, as long as they agree not to, uh, not to naturalize as American citizens or if they do so to return to Lebanon as, uh, as Ottoman subjects. And uh, so they aren't facing nearly the same challenges that, uh, that Armenians are facing. And in fact, on top of that, it uh, gets more specific. There's actually, the Ottoman state differentiates between uh, Armenians and the treatment of Armenian migrants and Assyrian migrants. So Assyrians who are migrating from the same regions as Armenians are not, uh, especially when it comes to the question of return, treated in the same way as, as Armenians. And in fact, uh, in Ottoman law, and this, this notion of Ermeni has a very, uh, religious connotation. It's, it's a member of the Armenian Apostolic Church. Uh, in the context of the law governing return, however, uh, Ottoman officials have to stipulate that when we are using the term Armeni, Armenian, uh, it refers to uh, Armenians who are members of the Apostolic Church, but also Armenians who are Roman Catholic and Armenians who are Protestant. So it becomes this very ethnic uh, definition of, uh, of Armenianness by the perspective of the Ottoman state, because what they want to prevent are people essentially converting to uh, Assyrian Orthodox or, uh, or Assyrian Catholic so that they can bypass these restrictions on Armenian return. Uh, so they actually have to specify this and differentiate between Armenians and Assyrians. So it is very, very specific to Armenians and, and, and therefore shapes the Armenian migratory experience in a very, very specific way that is not experienced by other uh, Ottoman migrating groups. Okay, so we are now going to break for coffee for 15 minutes, but before we do, I would like to thank our panelists for their excellent presentations, and thank you for engaging with them with your excellent questions. So let's come back in 15 minutes.
you might want to come down.
if we can uh, return to our seats and we can get the next session underway. Thank you. We're not too behind schedule, and if we get started, uh, we'll be in good shape. So come on back to your seats. Our speakers are chomping at the bit to get up here. That wasn't me, nor my phone. That was impressive, however. Thank you. So our first three speakers set an excellent example in uh, being right on time with their presentations. Excellent presentations they were. And I'm sure the quality will continue throughout the day. So let's get started with the second session now. The second session focuses on identities of the new community. And our moderator for the second session is Jennifer Manukian. Jennifer is a doctoral student in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures at UCLA and a translator from Western Armenian. And her book length translations include The Gardens of Silidar by Isabel Yesayan and The Candidate by Zare Vorpuni. And I'm very happy to say also that for her work uh, translating The Gardens of Silidar two years ago, she received uh, the Aronian Award for, for Excellence in Translating a Literary Work from, from, uh, from Nasser, which we were very happy to be able to bestow on her because she's doing such fantastic work. So please welcome Jennifer Manukian, moderator of the next session. Hi everyone, welcome to our second panel of the day. Uh, our first speaker asked me to keep his bio short, so I will uh, abide by his wishes. He, uh, his name is Harry S. Churkin, Jr., and he's a partner in the law firm of Drinker, Drinker Biddle, and Reith in Philadelphia. He'll be speaking to us today about assimilation and whiteness, a consideration of the United States versus Cartosian and its implications for the Armenian American community. Let me start out with a question. Are Armenians white? Perhaps a silly question today, but a pivotal, unsettled one in 1924. If we look back at the early 1920s, there was a shift from Wilsonian spirit of internationalism to one of Americanism as defined by the white Protestant dominant class. There was the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. A Red Scare threatened a wave of communism from east to west. Unemployed masses of post-World War I Europe posed a competitive threat to American workers. Nativism led to strong anti-immigration feelings. Certain foreigners were just considered un-American, unfit for assimilation, or genetically unsuited. 1880 was a pivotal year in immigration. Up until 1880, most of the immigrants came from Northern and Western Europe. After 1880, there was a larger influx of immigrants from Eastern and Southern Europe. In the background of the feelings of the 1920s, there were two naturalization quotas imposed, one in 1921 and a later one in 1924. In each case, they were more uh, successively stringent as far as naturalization opportunities became. In 1924, that quota reduced the number of immigrants who were allowed into the United States by about half to 164,167. That quota also skewed uh, 
naturalization in favor of the old immigrants, the Northern and Western Europeans. It reduced the number of immigrants from a nationality to 2% of that nationality as based on the 1890 census, rolling back the clock when there were, of course, fewer uh, immigrants from Southern and uh, Eastern Europe. That quota also made no distinction so that an immigrant from Turkey could have been a Sephardic Jew, a Muslim, a Greek Christian, an Armenian Christian. They were all lumped together. And under that quota, those who were specifically identified as Armenian, who were permitted to come to the United States to be naturalized, was reduced to 124 annually. Racial eligibility was established in 1790 by the first Congress, which limited naturalization to any alien being a free white person. Free white person. During Reconstruction in 1870, that uh, racial uh, description was broadened to include uh, African Americans to accommodate the emancipated slaves. But in 1882, another act of Congress precluded Chinese from citizenship because it was determined that Asiatic people should not be considered white. There were two seminal Supreme Court cases in 1922 which tried to clarify the situation. One said that a Japanese person could not become naturalized because uh, they were clearly of a different racial group and they therefore couldn't become naturalized. However, in the six months later, the United States reviewed a case involving an individual from the Indian subcontinent. Uh, uh, in that instance, they said, let's put aside the racial analysis and let's just ask the man on the street if he saw that individual walking down the street, would they identify that person as white or not? Therefore, the Japanese person was precluded because of a racial standard, even though he may be fairer skinned than many other individuals who were deemed to be white. But the Indian who was dark, though he might racially have been able to establish that he was uh, uh, an Aryan was precluded. So let's now look at the Armenian situation. On February 9th, 1923, 51 Armenians were on the ship Madonna that arrived in New York Harbor. They were not permitted to enter the United States even though they all had relatives in the United States and two were already engaged to marry individuals who had fought for the United States in World War I. Uh, the Reverend Miron Kalajan engaged an attorney named M. Vartan Malcolm to get a writ of habeas corpus to see if he, those Armenians could be released from the boat. Vartan Malcolm even had tugboats ready to go out to the boat to take the Armenians off the ship. A writ of habeas corpus was granted by Learned Hand, considered by many to be one of the most famous jurists of the 20th century. Malcolm ran to the docks, presented the writ of habeas corpus to have the Armenians taken off the boat. The commissioner of naturalization in, in New York, who had displayed uh, bigotries towards the Armenians said it's too late and they saw the ship go back out to sea into international waters. No one knows what happened to those 51 Armenians. In uh, 1909, rolling back the clock, there were cases that challenged the Armenians' right to naturalization. One involved a, a gentleman in Fresno. A more important case was uh, in Boston, where four Armenian immigrants uh, petitioned to have their denial of naturalization overturned. 
Their case was heard by a Boston Brahmin judge named Judge Lowell, Federal Judge Lowell. He, I would say, reluctantly found for the Armenians, saying it's up to Congress to tighten the standards and clarify what was really meant by the term white, because the Founding Fathers in 1790 certainly did not have the Armenians in mind when they established that standard. I told you 1924 was the pivotal case. It was the pivotal case because a gentleman named Tatos Kartosian in Portland, Oregon, petitioned for naturalization. This is an image of Mr. Cartosian that appeared on the front page of the Daily Oregonian. He's uh, with his two daughters, Hazel and Ori. His petition for naturalization was granted, but six months later, the U.S. Attorney for the District of Oregon petitioned the court to have it canceled on the basis that Mr. Cartosian was not white and therefore not entitled to naturalization. People immediately recognized the significance of this case. Your own Los Angeles Times on April 11th, 1924, carried an article that said this case had national and in fact international significance since the fate of many Armenians who have applied for citizenship hangs upon this issue. The survey in the same year, a magazine of contemporary social issues, said no more Armenians may become citizens and the citizenship of all who have at any time been naturalized would be forfeited if Mr. Cartosian lost his case. As you might guess, this, uh, this case sent shockwaves throughout the Armenian American community. Many students wrote the Commission of Naturalization in, the United, uh, in Washington saying, please clarify this situation. Armenian American veterans of World War I wrote and, and again asked the Commission of Naturalization saying, how can this be when I fought for the United States and now you're putting into question my naturalization? Within one month after the government commenced the ca cancelization action, an Armenian national, uh, Naturalization Committee was established with M. Vartan Malcolm, the same lawyer who tried to save the Armenians on the ship Madonna a year earlier, leading the charge. This is an image of uh, M. Vartan Malcolm, and I, I thank Mark Mamagonian and Nasser for providing me with this image and if I can get back to this list, here is a contemporary image of Mr. Malcolm at the time of the case. He organized a committee and wrote the, um, the U.S. Attorney and the Commission of Naturalization saying, is this a friendly case? Is it simply about Mr. Cartosian? Or are you really putting into question the entire Armenian American community, the right for them to become naturalized citizens? And could you maybe drop this case in Portland if you want to pursue it, and if it's not just about Cartosian, and bring it in Philadelphia, New York, Boston, where there are large Armenian communities, and maybe where the Armenians wouldn't be viewed as quite uh, exotic as they would be to people in Portland, Oregon at the time. Perhaps both of those questions showed Mr. Uh, Malcolm's naivete because they were both rejected by the United States government. The Armenian Naturalization Committee was formed by Malcolm but chaired by philanthropist and business leader Arshag Karagusian. That's an image of Mr. Karagusian. They immediately mobilized and engaged two extraordinary lawyers to represent Mr. Cartosian's interests. One was Wallace McCammett of the Portland firm of McCammett and Thompson, still exists today under a different name. He was valedictorian of his class of 1888 at Lafayette College, had been a, 
a justice of the Oregon Supreme Court, and been nominated to, appear, uh, to serve on the Ninth Circuit United States Court of Appeals. Because the Armenian Committee assumed right from the outset that they may have to take an appeal to, to the United States Supreme Court, they also engaged William D. Guthrie, one of the most distinguished lawyers in America at the time. He had been president of the New York State Bar Association, president of the Bar of the City in New York, was considered Supreme Court worthy as Calvin Coolidge had uh, seriously considered appointing him to a seat on the Supreme Court that he ultimately gave to Harlan F. Stone. The Armenian press followed this case, as you might guess, extremely closely. Gochnag, an, an organ of the Ar Armenian Protestant community, said that a, a defense fund of $100,000 had been raised to handle the matter for Mr. Kartosian even before appeals. It's worth noting that that's probably about $1.5 million today. Arshag Karagusian personally contributed 25% of uh, the defense costs. The Heidenik included many articles about this and said, everybody should be ready for monetary sacrifice. And it's the responsibility of every Armenian. Curiously, a little bit later, the Tashnag party in a communique that Heidenik published took Mr. Karagusian to task with a headline saying, Amot Baran Karagusian. Their view was that men like Karagusian had the most to gain, the most to lose, and that they shouldn't put the financial burden on the shoemakers and tailors and other Armenian Americans to contribute to the defense fund. Again, I remind you though, Mr. Karagusian not only uh, chaired the committee, but he also uh, contributed 25% of the, the defense funds. The Hunchak and Rangabar parties through their organs also weighed in. The, the Rangabar uh, articles were very balanced. There's one noteworthy article in the, the Hunchak uh, newspaper, which essentially said, we wonder whether Vartan Malcolm is just trying to make a big case out of this to earn fees. Uh, as a lawyer, I, I guess I'm used to people questioning lawyers and their fees. Uh, I can assure you that that wasn't Mr. Uh, Mr. Malcolm's motivation. The trial took place on May 8th and 9th, two-day trial before the federal judge Wolferton in the United States District Court for the District of Oregon. The United States government's argument was really two-pronged. Number one, the founding fathers in 1790 certainly did not envision someone like an Armenian being a naturalized citizen, and they certainly didn't think of Armenians at all and if they did, they wouldn't have thought of them as white. And they also made the point, back to that Supreme Court case I told you about, that the man on the street seeing an Armenian wouldn't necessarily think they were white. The defense called 17 witnesses, a really remarkable ar uh, array of witnesses, Let's think back of where the, the level of maturity of the Armenian American community at that time. The thrust of the Armenian defense, as awkward as it may be for us to think about, was that the man on the street would think of the Armenians as white. They emphasized the fairness of the complexions of many Armenians. They emphasized the color of the eyes of many Armenians. They um, discussed how the Armenians, even in the Middle East, when given an opportunity, would mingle with the Europeans as opposed to uh, associating with uh, uh, the Muslims. So therefore, could we go back, please? They called Two um, 
Armenian Protestant ministers, both of whom had congregations in Salem, Oregon, a Methodist and a Unitarian. This is Reverend Paranagyan. The other one was Reverend Farashetyan. They both testified that uh, they were accepted by their congregations, their congregations were all white, and that um, they were married to non-Armenians. They called Dr. George Arman, a physician practicing in Seattle, Washington. He testified in a similar manner. They called Gordon Luther, an Armenian who had anglicized his name, who was an engineer. They, he testified, what, what, they asked, what were the color of your eyes? He testified, they're blue. But now let's think of some of the experts that the Armenians motivated to testify on their behalf. Professor Roland uh, uh, Burgess Dixon of Harvard, who is Woodrow Wilson's personal advisor at the Paris Peace Conference, testified on, the, on behalf of the Armenians, and that the Armenians historically, even in the Middle East, had always been considered to be white. They next called Professor Franz Boaz of Columbia University. Franz Boaz is today recognized as the father of American anthropology. He found uh, no basis, as he put it, it would be utterly impossible to classify the Armenians as not belonging to the white race. Dr. Paul Rohrbach traveled from um, Berlin, he, where he was the professor of geography and political anatomy to discuss the Ar Armenian physical traits. Dr. James Barton, known to many of you, also testified about his experience working with Armenian relief, as did H.P. Underwood, who uh, worked with the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions. He was uh, cross-examined as to how the Armenians, for example, would compare to the Italians. And he said, physically, there is the great, as great a disparity among our, our Armenians as there are among Italians, particularly comparing the northern Italians to the southern Italians. A whole slew of witnesses from fraternal orders, such as the Moose, Oddfellows, Elks, Woodmen of the World, Knights of Pythias, and Masons were all called in a little embarrassing way today to testify that we would definitely admit an Armenian or we already have admitted Armenians into our fraternal organizations, but we would never admit an African-American. Armin Tertsakian testified. Could we go back, please? Armin Tertsakian was a co-founder of Liberty Orchards with Mark Balaban, the makers of applets and cotlets. He traveled from Kashmir, Washington to testify. Again, talking about his experience with the Boy Scouts, being Protestant, having never ex experienced any uh, discrimination. In my view, the most important witness, the woman who carried the day for the Armenians, was Mrs. Otis Floyd Lampson. There's an image of Mrs. Lampson and her husband. This is an image of, could you go back, please? Mrs. Lampson, perfect, in later years. She was the archetypal assimilated Armenian. She married um, one of America's most distinguished physicians of the time. Uh, she uh, had been the personal tutor in Cleveland to the children of John D. Rockefeller Sr. Her maiden name was Tashkin. And her testimony clearly made an enormous impression on the judge. Discussing her experience as a girl uh, in Asia Minor, her education in Europe, and her life in the United States. M. Vartan Malcolm also testified. Uh, Vartan Malcolm was really grilled by the prosecution. Here is, uh, if you could go back. Um, that's a, an inscription of uh, uh, Malcolm's book, Armenians in America, that he inscribed to uh, Alton Parker, who who ran uh, uh, for president of the United States. It's inscribed thanking him for his support of the Armenians. Uh, he was defeated by Theodore Roosevelt. 
I'm told my time is up, so you want to know how the case ended. So in, 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 the, in the briefs after trial, the United States held a, its position. The Armenians submitted an extraordinary brief noting that if they lost the case, the right to vote would be gone, the right to practice certain professions uh, would be gone, the right to own property would be gone, and they would be deported. It took a year for the judge to issue his opinion. The judge, primarily citing the testimony of Arminui Tashjan Lamson, found for the Armenians. If you give me 30 seconds, I just want to say that there was a great uh, controversy as to whether the United States would appeal the decision. Um, the Armenians were ready for an appeal to the Supreme Court, as I said. The Armenians, through uh, William Guthrie, the appellate lawyer they had retained, kept pressing the United States for a, a determination of whether they take an appeal. And I uh, found a letter dated December 30, 1925, to Mr. Guthrie, in which uh, it is stated that the United States had always planned for an, a, an appeal if there was an adverse ruling in favor of Mr. Kartosian. The letter goes on to state that the Armenian Naturalization Committee put on an extraordinary defense on behalf of Mr. Kartosian and the Armenian Americans, and they ultimately concluded, the Solicitor General and uh, the Department of Labor both concluded that it would not be in America's best interest to um, bring a, a, an appeal to the uh, ruling in favor of uh, Mr. Kartosian. And uh, the letter concludes by saying that the Armenians can stay in America. The letter was signed by the Attorney General of the United States, Mr. Sargent. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Our next speaker will be Gregory Aftandilian. Uh, Gregory Aftandilian is an adjunct professor at Boston University and American University, as well as a writer and a consultant. He previously worked for the US government for over 20 years. Today, he will be talking to us about World, World War II as a transformative period for the Armenian American passage. Well, thank you very much. And um, as a board member of Nasser, um, I also want to say I'm very pleased that my organization um, is co-sponsoring this event. And I also want to thank uh, Maggie and uh, Mark Mamagonian for their, all their hard work putting this together, as, fellows, as well as my fellow board members out here in California. Uh, before I begin with my topic, I just want to wish everybody a happy St. Patrick's Day. Uh, but I have to say that the relations between Armenians and the Irish today are much different from what they were back in the late 19th century. Um, one early, um, as the two groups, say, in an industrial city like Worcester competed for jobs, one early Armenian immigrant uh, uh, said half-jokingly that he had to, quote, eat five kuftes, a big bowl of madzun, knock down three Irishmen to get to his job at the mill. Um, so, uh, and that's actually from Bob Myrak's uh, sort of seminal book, The Torn Between Two Lands. But um, I just want to say relations are better today, especially in a place like Boston, which has big communities of both groups. Uh, now for the topic at hand. Um, I'm going to talk about the Armenian American experience during World War II. Uh, part of this experience is very similar to the experience of other ethnic groups in America at the time. Um, as many of you know, many of these groups settled in the big industrial cities um, of the East Coast and Midwest. Uh, excuse me. Um, of course, some of them, uh, the Armenians, of course, came to Fresno as farmers. Um, but uh, they had very similar experiences like the Italian Americans in these cities. Uh, many of them settled in these sort of closed ethnic ghettos, um, and there would be sort of turfs. You know, sort of, uh, this would be one ethnic group in one neighborhood, another uh, ethnic group in another neighborhood. Um, 
but uh, for the more mainstream Americans, say those of um, English or Scottish descent whose families have been here for a long, long time, uh, these groups were, quote, different in their languages, their customs, their food, their religions. Uh, they were looked down upon as, quote, unquote, foreigners. And even the American-born children of these immigrants were tarnished with the foreigner label. Uh, one of my favorite short stories by William Saroyan, in fact, is called The Foreigner. And um, he wrote the story in 1948, uh, but the story takes place initially in the 1930s or the late 1920s as he was a school kid in Fresno. Uh, in this story, an Armenian-American uh, pupil, the protagonist in the story in Fresno, uh, befriends a Syrian-Armenian class classmate named Hak Harap who warns him, quote, not to fool with the Americans, um, just laugh at them. And then when the Soroyan character insists that I'm an American, what are you talking about? The Syrian American kid says, you'll find out what you are soon enough. Um, and then shortly thereafter, uh, the Armenian American pupil uh, encounters ethnic insults from his teacher. Um, and then he talks back to the teacher, he gets in trouble and, and that's part of the story. Then the story shifts to the immediate post-war period where uh, his Syrian-Armenian friend, Hawk, gets ready to host, host a poker game with um, his fellow sort of ethnic buddies from the old neighborhood. And, um, but then Hawk sees these uh, group of quote-unquote Americans trying to steal watermelons from his farm. So he takes out a gun, acts deranged, and he forces all these um, quote-unquote American watermelon stealers uh, to uh, be humiliated, and he forces them to sing various songs. Finally, he forces them to sing God Bless America um, and lets them loose after they think they're going to be shot to death. Uh, but then the story um, strangely ends very differently, very sadly, because an Italian-American uh, buddy in the poker game was relating the story and uh, one of them, and then he has tears in his eyes. So another buddy says, well, why are you crying? He says, well, uh, Hawk was just having a little fun. But then the other guy says, well, I'm remembering the guys who didn't come back from the war. So that was a very sort of poignant, uh, I think, ending to the story. And for those of you who know Soroyan, uh, Soroyan usually would, um, you know, gamble, get into debt, then hold himself up in a hotel, crank out short stories, um, as a way to make money. Soroyan, in this case, had a very difficult time with the story. We know that from his correspondence with the Heidenreich Association, which published it. Uh, I think just because he was weight, this, this, uh, this issue of prejudice was so weighty for him, he really had kind of personal problems writing the story. In fact, he actually, the initial title of this story was The Veteran of Foreign Wars, uh, which I think is perhaps more apt. Um, so anyway, um, the war, I think, afforded a lot of these American-born kids of immigrant parents the opportunity to show that they were just as American as anybody else. So the war um, allowed them to prove how patriotic they were. And this was actually also a genuine feeling among these young people uh, because a uh, great patriotic wave swept through the United States um, in the early 1940s, and they all wanted to join up and to fight for their uh, country. Um, one of the um, sociolog sociological studies from the 1970s that interviewed ethnic Americans from world, the World War II era, uh, this is on Slavic Americans, they said, quote, the war afforded a way of openly affirming and asserting through proof that one was American. Uh, they sought eagerly to remove the wider community, in the wider community's eyes, that they were foreigners and not American. Um, and one World War II veteran, an ethnic American, said the war, quote, brought people together who had never been brought together before. Before, everyone was in their own little group. During the war, everyone got to know everyone else, and they all discovered that blood was all red. Um, and I, in fact, just ironically today, I got a phone call from my old uh, roommate from college. He was a Greek American. And he said, you know, my father grew up in Lowell, Massachusetts. He probably never even ventured out of Massachusetts before the war. 
<laughs> so the war, you know, uh, shipped everybody across the country. People got to know each other, um, and that was uh, helped to kind of break down barriers. Um, interestingly enough, if you look at the early war posters, uh, the typical GI would, would be somebody from a Norman Rockwell painting, kind of waspy looking. Uh, but um, there's a guy, um, and actually it's in Hike Des Moines' book, uh, Harry Kazarian from Providence. He was um, one of the most, excuse me, decorated Marines from the Okinawa campaign. And he appeared at the end of the war in 1945 on the cover of the New York Times Sunday Magazine in his battle fatigues in Okinawa. But here's this dark, swarthy, kind of stocky guy, not somebody you would see in a kind of a Norman Rockwell painting. So you can see even in the matter of a few years during the war how the, the perception of the quote-unquote foreigner or the, the American-born kid of foreign parents, that perception had changed. And if you look at the Hollywood movies from the early 19, sorry, the late 1940s talking about, you know, depicting the war effort, there's always an Italian-American young kid uh, who helps his buddies in Italy during the campaign, or some Greek American soldier? So the the ethnic American soldier um, is now seen as part of the American mainstream. So in that respect, the Armenian story is very similar to um, the other stories. However, I have to say, in a place like Fresno, uh, it took a long time for prejudice to actually finally go away. Uh, there's a picture next door in the, in the uh, Ararat Eskijin Museum of Viktor Mavakian, who was one of the most decorated Marines in World War II. Uh, he fought very bravely in the Pacific. I heard a story when I was doing interviews for uh, my research. I talked to some Armenian-American World War II veterans in Fresno, and they were kind of laughing about this, even though it's kind of a sad story, but when Mavakian comes back to Fresno, um, at the end of the war, the wealthy Armenians in Fresno wanted to buy him a nice house, you know. He's, the, he's their hero. So uh, they found a nice house in a nice neighborhood of Fresno, but they couldn't purchase that house because there were still discriminatory land covenants that you couldn't sell your house uh, to an Armenian as, a, as well as other groups that, I think this ties into Harry's talk, that were considered Asiatic or other things like that. Um, now, what is then unique, though, about the Armenian American experience? Well, um, one of the unique things, of course, is that the uh, Armenian American GIs were also the children of genocide survivors. This kind of puts them apart, say, from the other American uh, ethnic uh, soldiers in World War II. Um, and it's interesting that, um, you know, in some families, the genocide was discussed, but in a lot of Armenian American families, the genocide survivor parents wanted to shield their children from the ordeals that, that, they, all, that they had went through, had gone through. Um, and so, I mean, the young people growing up of genocide survivor parents knew their parents had suffered, but didn't really know the full extent of that. And then when the war came, it's very interesting that uh, the genocide issue, I found, resurfaced within the family. Uh, in other words, the, 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 as, as what the Jews call for Holocaust, children of Holocaust survivors, the conspiracy of silence, the conspiracy of silence was broken. Because now, all of a sudden, you can imagine, they're sending their first sons off to war. So only about 20, 25 years after the genocide, now they're being confronted with this new uh, uh, sort of uh, horrendous uh, uh, ordeal, um, and as Valojan Karens wrote in his book about the Providence Armenian community, um, it was, quote, traumatic for many parents to fathom this new crisis after having lived through their own war experiences, which had devastated their lives. Uh, so there was a lot of uh, very um, traumatic uh, sort of farewells to the young uh, Armenian American soldiers uh, in their families. And uh, one of the um, veterans who's still alive, uh, he's a relative, he lives in the Laguna Niguel, he's 93 years old, high Tashjan. Um, he, he was uh, actually a navigator on bombers going from England to Germany. And if you know the history of World War II, those guys suffered tremendous casualties. Um, and basically, uh, the, the attrition rate was, was really horrendous. 
uh, and he's always sort of said, you know, he, he doesn't really know how he sort of got through that period considering, you know, um, you're, when you f go on, a, on one of those missions, you never know if you're going to come back. But what was interesting is that he actually, when I was interviewing him, uh, got more emotional about s talking about leaving home than he did about his combat experiences in World War II. Uh, and in fact, um, he, re he, s he related the story to me about, um, and, and another uh, veteran did so too, about how their mother chased after the troop train as, as it was leaving the station. And that's what really kind of set him off uh, emotionally, talking about the wartime period, actually even more than his combat experiences. And uh, this was a pattern as well because um, Armenian-American soldiers, uh, I found, were very much concerned about how their parents back home were actually taking the news of their wartime experiences. Um, I interviewed this uh, veteran, Kenneth Kazanjian. Um, he grew up in Watertown. Unfortunately, he passed away a few years ago, but what's fascinating is that he was an uh, American uh, soldier in France. He was captured by the Germans, put into a German POW camp. Um, he, was, uh, he lost about 50 pounds, excuse me, during the war, well, during that captivity, but he kept a diary during that time period, and uh, the diary was published in the Hyannik uh, Weekly right after he came back from the war, and so part of my interview with him was I would actually read him excerpts from his diary and have him reflect on that um, 60 years later. Um, and his last diary entry was, uh, my family is in good health now, and God only knows how much I worried about that while I was a prisoner of war. So I thought that was kind of fascinating. I said, well, you know, what, what do you mean by good health? And he basically said, I was worried about, you know, the psychological health of my parents, even though he himself was a prisoner of war, suffering terribly during that type of deprivation. So I, I thought that was a, just a very interesting finding uh, from my own research during this time. Um, there was also very interesting um, comments by the veterans um, also about the sheer violence of the war that made them understand, I think, what their own parents had gone through uh, during the genocide. Uh, there were even cases of Armenian-American veterans, excuse me, um, liberating the concentration camps in Germany and Austria during the war. And uh, there was a, there's an excerpt of a letter I, I sort of like to read from this time period. And what's interesting, too, for those of you who maybe want to do some more research on this topic, but the 1940s, in the, in the Hyrenic Weekly and the Armenian Mirror Spectator, there's a lot of letters from these GIs, and that's really interesting first-hand accounts of what they had gone through. So this is um, Walter Basmajan from Messina, New York, writing a letter in, in April of 45, only a month before World War II ends in Europe. He says, um, I wouldn't believe these stories of ut utmost cruelty had I not seen all this and more. I wouldn't believe that such people could live upon the earth um, if I had, hadn't seen the bodies along the roadsides and the ones found at the concentration camps. Um, and then he talks about how the Nazi SS officers were all monsters. And what's interesting, though, he ends his letter by saying, quote, <clears throat> I keep remembering that this was what the Turks did to the Armenians, only the Armenians had never had a chance to let the world know. Actually, nobody cared or probably wouldn't believe them. And then he says, now I know because I have seen this. So I think um, the wartime experience actually made that generation even more sensitive uh, to the genocide issue than they had previously uh, thought. Um, there were also, if you look at some of these letters, there are also some very humorous stuff. Um, one of the interesting things is that um, these Armenian-American GIs love to write about how much they missed Armenian food. Um, uh, one guy, uh, I, this is a really funny letter, he writes, you know, I, I've been stationed at these various camps in the United States be before he gets sent overseas. Uh, the food has been lousy. 
but then I get, to, get sent to a place, an army base near Fresno. There's a guy in my barracks who's an Armenian, and he says, you know, my aunt lives only a few miles away, so when, he gets, when they get a weekend leave, he goes to this, his buddy's uh, aunt's house in Fresno, and he's like in seventh heaven. You know, he actually lists all the pieces of Armenian food uh, that he's been eating. Um, so, and, and then there was also very interesting correspondence um, about uh, Armenians meeting each other, um, Armenian American Jais meeting each other in different parts of the world. Um, and some of, the, some of them also met Armenians, of course, all over the world. The fortunate ones were in India because uh, there was wealthy Armenian merchants in India, so the Armenian American GIs were wined and dined. But there were also cases in France where, you know, the French citizens during World War II were, you know, deprived of a lot of things, including food. So when Armenian American GI would see a French Armenian uh, citizen in France, they would actually give them their food rations and help them out. Um, there are also interesting cases where uh, Armenian American soldiers uh, would also have an address of their relatives, say, in Marseille. So when they would uh, finally get to France, they would try to get a weekend leave to, uh, especially once the fighting ended, to go to Marseille and visit their relatives and be the, these kind of family connectors. Um, there was even a case where um, Armenians really sort of saved each other's lives. Um, uh, a veteran I interviewed, Ed Herosian, um, he lives in Massachusetts. He's still alive, thank God. But he told me the story. He was in the Battle of the Bulge. And for those of you who know that history as well, there was a massacre by the Nazi SS, excuse me, of um, American uh, POWs. Um, and in retaliation, a lot of American GIs were just taking German prisoners and shooting them in retaliation. So things were really bad. Uh, anyway, he's, he comes across you know, this, um, uh, th this sort of uh, makeshift headquarters, and uh, there is these two guys in German uniforms, and uh, he says, um, and he, all of a sudden he hears them speaking Armenian, and he says, you know, what's going on? He says, um, well, you know, we were captured by the Germans, and you know, either we we're going to starve to death or they or allowed us to co go to the Western Front. So he goes, you know, please don't let them shoot us <laughs> uh, because we're not German. And so then he tells his fellow Armenian American uh, GIs, you know, these guys aren't German. Just send them to the POW camp. Don't shoot them. Um, so just like in a matter of a few seconds, you know, people's lives can be saved. Uh, so the, in conclusion, I just want to say that how the war uh, both, I think, enhanced that generation's Americanism but also because of all these issues that I just raised in the last few minutes, uh, raised their, raise their Armenianness at the same time. So that's why I find this wartime period so fascinating. And then just one other thing too, um, you know, the GI Bill, uh, for those of you who may know about this, um, allowed the veterans to actually uh, go to college and universities um, after their wartime service tuition free. The Armenian American community was so poor at the time, most parents couldn't afford that type of tuition. But the GI Bill allowed them to go to college and that moved the, the community from the working class to the middle class all in one generation. So that's why this, the wartime experience was also very, very important. So with that, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Gregory. Our uh, last speaker for this panel will be uh, Vartan Matsyosyan, who, in addition to being my friend and mentor from New York, is the executive director of the Armenian National Education Committee. Uh, as a historian and literary scholar, he has his PhD in history from the Institute of History, National Academy of Sciences of the Republic of Armenia. Today, he will be speaking to us about the early times of the Armenian American press. Thank you, Jennifer, for that presentation. Uh, 
let's start by saying that this is a work in progress. Uh, I will not mention every name of newspaper published until the outbreak of World War II. And also, let me remind you that I have not checked every publication I will mention, which would have meant to go everywhere around the world to every single key Armenian library and then some, and perhaps even not finding what I would uh, search for. So, four scores and 19 years ago, on March 25th, 1919, Haigag Eginian died from a heart attack in Fresno at the age of 54, while typing an editorial for Nord Young, New Life, the seventh and last paper, newspaper he published and edited over three decades. It is only fitting to dedicate this outline of the first 50 years of the Armenian American press to the memory of who has been justly called the father of the Armenian American press, who published the first community newspapers from coast to coast. Eginyan had worked as a typist for a Turkish newspaper in his hometown, Diyarbakir, uh, before he arrived in New Jersey in 1883. He started his journalistic career in May 1888 at the age of 23. So May also marks the 130th anniversary of the Armenian American press. Here, uh, he published the first issue of the weekly Arekag, Sun, in West Hoboken, later moved to Sterling. It lasted just four months. Its successor was Surhantak, Messenger, first a monthly and then a weekly, first in New York and then in West Hoboken from February to December 1889, when it changed its name to Azadutun, Freedom. The renamed newspaper was so successful that it became a semi-weekly, but the success not, was not so much because it folded in March 1890, three months later. Eginian's newspapers were a one-man show, as he was publisher, editor, typist, printer, and deliverer. The first decade of the press would be characterized by private entrepreneurship and the absolute predominance of the East Coast, where most of the community had, was concentrated. Two periodicals appeared in New York in 1891, Ararat, edited by Parnak Ivadian from 1891-92, and Hike, a semi-monthly published and edited by Sampat Gabrielian from 1891-98. The next one, Hayot Sashkar, Armenian World, published by Hrant Kirishian in 1895, apparently did not go past the first issue. Two weeklies appeared next in 1897, and two, were, two had uh, names of rivers, Yeprat, Euphrates, published in Worcester by B.A. Shahgalian, which lasted a year, and Dikris, Tigris, published in New York by Eginian, who made the comeback after seven years. In the meantime, he had become a member of the reformed Honchagian party, the Veryagazmial Honchagian Gusak Tsutyun, a splinter of the Honchagian party after internal quarrels of 1896, and this time he had a partner, Tovmas Charshavtian, who was a member of the Armenian Revolutionary Federation. Despite obvious divergences, I don't need to tell you why, they managed to publish the newspaper together for little more than a year. 1899 was the first watershed year. The political parties made their entrance in the scene, even though even through the back door. Charshavtian parted ways with Eginian and published the first issue of the weekly Hydenic Fatherland in New York with a group of ARF comrades. Soon, Boston became the Armenian center in the country, Hyrenik moved there, and became the official organ of the ARF in 1901. It was turned into the tri-weekly in 1913 and a daily in 1915. After 76 years, it became a weekly once again in 1991, currently published out of Watertown, Massachusetts. Eginian, on the other hand, sold decrease to Karikin Chichian and Mkhoshahen, who renamed it Tsain Hyrenias, Voice of the Fatherland, and then moved it first to Worcester and then to Boston, where it became the reformed and Chagian organ from 1900 to 1906. For a hint about the good relations that the ARF and reformed and Chagians enjoyed in those early days, the following paragraph of an article published in, in the issue 62 December 29, 1900, of Tsain Hyrenians, may suffice. Has the Hyrenic newspaper heard that a new paper in Armenia has started publication in Boston? Nothing extraordinary here, though. 
The political ideologi ideological rift between the ARF and non-ARF sides would dominate with ups and downs the entire 20th century. In 1906, an internal dispute in the Reformed Honchakian Party ended with the publication in 1907 of Second Weekly, Ask Nation, which became the organ of a newly founded Armenian Democratic Constitutional Samati Ramgar Party in 1908. And be are here with me because the parties will, will change names over the next 13 years. Ask would turn into a semi weekly in 1915 and a daily in 1916. Tsain Hyrenias interrupted his publication in April 1908, which it resumed in October, but in Constantinople. Therefore, it ceased being an Armenian-American publication. In 1910, the reformed Honchagians published a new weekly, Bahak, Guard, in Providence. It moved to Boston in 1915, where it was a semi-weekly by 1917 and a tri-weekly in 1920. After October 1921, when the merger of several conservative and liberal Armenian parties created the Armenian Democratic Liberal Party, Ram Gawara Zadrangu Saksutun in Constantinople, Ask and Bahak merged in Boston, becoming the daily Ask Bahak, Nation Guard, renamed Baikar Struggle in 1922. Baikar also published an yearly special issue from 1942-1960 which became a literary quarterly from 1961-67. After 60 years, the daily itself became a weekly in 1982 and then a monthly in 1993. Interestingly, it was moved to Yerevan as a monthly from 1995 to 98 and then interrupted publication for the next 19 years. Now it's being published since last year as a weekly again back in Boston. Now, it's interesting to point out that for many decades, the cover of Baikar has fe featured the line founded in 1899 as Tsain which might lead to assume that Tsain was its predecessor. However, that line is inaccurate and perhaps derived from the desire to have a genealogy as old as its main daily competitors, Hydenic the Hydenic Daily, so in order to show up that Hydenic and Baikar were uh, both founded in the same year, which is actually not true, because as we have seen, Baikar resulted from the union of Ask and Bahak, and Ask was born from the internal split that pitted it against Tsain Hydenyat and was not born from Tsain Hydenyat, so there is not a direct genealogy here. The next arrival to the partisan divide would be Iriasart Hayastan, Young Armenia, the weekly of the Social Democrat Hanchagian Party, launched in 1903 in Boston. It went from place to place several times, New York, 1906, Providence, 1913, Chicago, 1917, back to Boston, 1923, and finally, again in New York, until 1973. It became a semi-weekly in 1916, and again a weekly from 1965 to 73. It resumed publication as a monthly in 1975 until its final demise in its 100th year, 2003. In its last years, it was published in Paramus, New Jersey. Boston was also a birthplace of Gochnak, the weekly launch in 1900 by a group of evangelical priests, which moved to New York in 1909. Despite its roots, Gochnak was far from being a religious publication. It tried to elevate itself above the partisan fray without avoiding issues that had an all Armenian interest, be them political, cultural, or social. After 50 years of weekly publication, it became a monthly in 1960 until its demise in 1968. In the East, one should mention the independent weekly Grung, published by Karnik Kevorkian in Philadelphia from 1919-1962, and also the monthly Husharar, organ of the Armenian General Benevolent Union, UAGBU, published from 1913 until the first years of this century. Now let's go or come to the West Coast, following the trail of Eginian, who moved to Fresno in 1899 after selling decrease. The old bag of journalism followed him, and in 1902 he launched the first Armenian newspaper of the West Coast, the Wiki Kahakatsi, The Citizen, would last until 1909, when Eginian briefly renamed it North Serunt, New Generation, and then North Serunt Kaakatsi, New Generation Citizen, from 19, 1909 to 1912. 
He continued it in 1914 with a new newspaper, North Young, which after his death in 1919 became the organ of the recently founded National Democratic Party, as Kain Ramgavaragan Gusaksutyun. In 1908, meantime, a group of ARF members published the weekly Aspares Arena. It would soon become an official organ of the party. It moved to Los Angeles in 1970 as a semi-weekly and became a daily in the 1980s when it moved to Glendale and more recently to Little Armenia. Today, it is the only Armenian daily in the United States. Mikhail Minasian had first published the cultural and scientific monthly Lewis in Boston between 1901 and 1908 when he returned to the Ottoman Empire. Back to the United States during the war, he started publishing the weekly CIS-1 in Fresno in 1918. In 1920, Norg Young merged with CIS-1 and became the bi-weekly Norg Young CIS-1, which had another merger in 1921 with Aror Plaf, a democratic constitutional newspaper started in 1920. The new paper was first called Norg Young CIS-1 Aror then Norg Young Aror, and finally Nor Ori in 1922, thanks God. Uh, we have to say that these mergers and continuous mergers between the, in the Ramgavar press from the early 20th century, 1922, were quite frequent, as you can see, not here, but also in other communities where they had uh, newspapers. After more than 40 years in Fresno, uh, Noror, as a bi-weekly, moved to Los Angeles in 1965 and to Pasadena in the 1990s, first as a bi-weekly and now as a weekly. Among various newspapers of California, I should mention the independent bi-weekly Meshach Tiller, published between 1925 and 1957 by Levon Lulegian. 1922 became the second watershed. At this point, let's remember that we had two dailies, daily newspapers in the United States. As we have seen, the democratic liberal newspapers by Karan or Or took their current names in that year. Simultaneously, the fourth leg of the Armenian political table appeared in New York. The weekly Panvor, Worker, published by the Armenian Progressive League, or the Armenian section of the Communist Party of the U.S., if you prefer. In 1938, it was renamed Le Rapper Newsletter. And this new weekly remained in New York until 1978 and, moved Los and, and, and when it moved to Los Angeles, where it ceased publication in 1990 on the brink of the Soviet collapse. 1922 also witnessed the publication in Boston of the most important Armenian-American cultural journal in Armenian, the Hyrenic Monthly. There had been several short-lived pu literary publications before, Shant, Lightning, 1910 by Shahan Natali, and Punic, Phoenix, 1918-1920 by Shahan Natali, Neshan Destegul, and Iria Melikian, both in Boston, and even a short-lived journal Navasart in 1922 in New York by Edward Sahagyan. The Hyrenic Monthly, a literary, historical, and political journal published until 96 as a monthly and quarterly for two more years, concentrated much of the intellectual activity of the diaspora until the outbreak of World War II. A, lit a purely literary monthly, Norkir, New Letter, edited by Antranik Antriasian, regrouped non-ARF writers from 1936-37 and was relaunched by Benjamin Nurigian as a quarterly from 1938-54. In the 1920s, the compatriotic unions started their magazines to keep a link with the lost country and among the survivors of a particular place. Some names. Hajan in Pasadena, Malatias Babukti in Cleveland, Arkios from, of Chomachlu in New York, also Gurini Husher, Nor Arabkira, Nor Sebastian, so on and so forth. It is time now for a brief overview of the English language press. We should start with Armenia, Armenia published from 1904-1906 by the reformed Hunchakian party. It was not a community paper and not a, a partisan paper, but a monthly devoted to promote Armenian culture as a whole among non-Armenians and English speakers, rather than just the reality of the unspeakable barbarities inflicted upon the Armenians, as its introductory statement wrote. The monthly discontinued publication due to the internal quarrels of the reformed Hunchakians. 
Arshak Mahdesian, who had published the weekly Arziv in Armenia from 1905-1908 and had, be had been business manager of Armenia, relaunched the journal as New Armenia in 1910. It would be renamed Oriental World for a short while and published it until 1929. Another monthly with a similar target but essentially devoted to political propaganda was the Armenian Herald, published the Armenia, by the Armenian National Union from 1917-1919. One should also mention the Armenian Student, a magazine published by the Armenian Student Association around 1930-31. The third watershed year that I would like to mention is 1932, when the first English language community weeklies appeared on both coasts. In the East, the Armenian Democratic Liberal Party started publishing the Armenian Mirror as a weekly in Boston. In 1939, it merged with the Armenian Spectator, an independent weekly published by John Tashian in New York, becoming the Armenian Mirror Spectator to this day, with headquarters in Watertown. Also in 1932, the Heidenic Daily launched an English section on its fourth page, and its success led to the foundation of the Heidenic Weekly in 1933, first as the organ of the Tsegagron, now called the Armenian Youth Federation, and later as an ARF organ. The newspaper was renamed the Armenian Week in 1969, and it is also published in Watertown uh, nowadays. In the West, an Armenian English weekly, the Armenian Reporter, was published in Los Angeles from 1932-35. It was the first of three homonymous newspapers to appear in the United States. This independent newspaper had a young aspiring writer as its English e editor, Leon Surmelian. After the first generation that had set the grounds of the press in the Armenian language, the second generation, like Sermelian did, had left the language, and this, uh, this uh, meant that the grounds of the English-speaking press had to be set. The struggle for community survival amid the push between assimilation and integration had entered a new phase. Thank you. I can invite all the panelists up. We'll have uh, 15 minutes for question and answers. Okay, if you'd like to raise your hand, we can bring the microphone to you. Anyone? All right, thank you for the, to the speakers. Uh, I'm going to direct my two interrelated questions to Baro Mateosian. Uh, my two simple questions are, to what extent historically was the Armenian periodical press capitalistic, which is to say driven by profit and not selfless service and so on? I've always wondered about that. And my second related question was, um, why was the rate at which Armenian newspapers failed uh, so high? It seems that, um, well, you outlined very well how newspapers open close, how one editor opened seven newspapers in his lifetime and so on. Um, I should say that my familiarity with the topic and therefore the background to my questions takes me to like the middle of the 20th century or so, so I don't know about the rest. Um, I would say that uh, most of newspapers were published by organizations and they were not uh, driven by profit specifically. Of course they had to make money because they, try, they, they would try very hard to be self-sufficient. Uh, and especially we find this in the uh, party newspapers where almost every year they have uh, campaigns uh, to get new subscri subscribers uh, and, uh, you know, try to balance their budgets. Uh, 
In the case of other publications, of course, the competitive unions and uh, also the AGBU, etc., uh, the, primar the primary idea was to um, bring out information uh, or uh, link people in the community to each other. Um, it's it's uh, interesting to mention that Haigage uh, Minyan in his very first newspaper in Arekak wrote that uh, the reason for this newspaper, I'm not quoting uh, verbatim indeed, the main reason for this newspaper is uh, to establish a relationship. So to even, even though people in the States at that moment, in the late, late 1888, uh, 1890s, mostly they were uh, almost uh, half literate, uh, they somehow needed something to link each other, a newspaper. So, uh, but anyway, uh, Eginian's idea was not to make money. He published his newspapers uh, in the evening, in the evenings and in the weekends. Uh, again, the same happens with most newspapers later, especially the, the organizational newspapers. In the case of the individual ones, there may be, you, you must find some kind of uh, try to uh, get some profit, but it's not always the idea. And this is why many of them, uh, they don't resist uh, that long. And the ones who resist, of course, because they can at least balance their budget and, you know, be self-sufficient. But sometimes they have their owners, they have uh, another work, another job to, uh, to, make, to make money. Uh, regarding the second question was about um, uh, some of them failed. Some of them, they didn't fail that much. I mean, uh, the, the party newspapers, because of their party backgrounds, they lasted very long. And not only those. Um, I would say that those who failed, failed first of all because they couldn't manage to, uh, the enough money. And second, because they couldn't find uh, a real audience to make their point. Uh, I mean, sometimes when you published uh, when you published an independent newspaper, uh, you need to make sure why you are publishing, what's the, the your goal, and how you differentiate from the other newspapers. Uh, some newspapers have had success over many decades because they found uh, an audience able to, uh, to listen to them for something that they have driven across, the, some points that they have driven, uh, driven across. And in some other cases, uh, just because uh, they were uh, strikingly against, let's say, the parties, and this they gave them uh, enough leverage as to have a public that didn't want to uh, rely on uh, party newspaper for their uh, news feed. I guess I, I try to give my general answer to your questions. Um, sorry, my, my question is for Mr. Harry. Regarding the Cartesian case, uh, Armenians who were Protestant or converted to Protestantism uh, at that time, would they had an easier life in America or were they considered more white than an Armenian Orthodox or Catholic? Well, that's possibly a, a question that should be posed to a, a sociologist, but it's clear that in the defense of uh, Mr. Kartosian and the Armenian community, the entire initiative was to underscore the ability of Armenians to assimilate. The mainstream dominant class were white and Protestant. And so therefore, every Armenian witness who appeared was a Protestant. There were no uh, Catholics or uh, uh, Orthodox witnesses among the Armenians. Uh, so I think that, that 
they knew their audience and they knew what they were trying to achieve, and that is to prove that the Armenians assimilated. My, my talk was based on a 100-page paper, so it, it was very difficult to conclude, uh, conclude what I should add and what I should subtract. One of the things I could have mentioned is that uh, Mr. Malcolm sent a survey around to 100, uh, excuse me, 400 uh, Armenian Americans at the time. Over 300 responded. These were all individuals he was able to identify as uh, having, quote, assimilated. He asked them questions such as, where were you educated? Is your wife Armenian? Are you Protestant? So he was clearly trying to establish that the Armenians have mainstreamed. As I mentioned, uh, Barton Malcolm himself, he was a graduate of Amherst College and Harvard Law School. He was married to a Swiss woman. His wife's sister, obviously also Swiss, was married to one of the other most distinguished Armenians of his day, Dr. V.H. Kazanjan now recognized as the father of, of plastic surgery and the uncle of the, the actress Arlene Francis. So these were two uh, uh, individuals who were Protestant, who were extremely well educated, and they realized that that was the story that had to be told to uh, aid in the defense of Cartesian. I've, I've also read this book, um, The Armenians in America, by um, Vartan Malcolm. And uh, what was striking in the first few pages of the book that always stuck with me, he said, uh, the, he said, the Armenians are the Anglo-Saxons of the Middle East. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's an important book to read, and it's in Haig's, it's in Haig's book. Uh, but it was certainly, in, in my view, a, a, a political piece that was written just a few years before this case, but it was, it was written to show how the Armenians had mainstreamed and to garner support for the Armenian cause. And in fact, it was published by an Armenian organization that was uh, trying to solicit American support for a Republic of Armenia. So uh, he clearly had this theme in his life that he was trying to underscore. Uh, this is for you, Mr. Afandiljan. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. I'm first generation Armenian, and uh, my parents came from Sebastia, present day Savaz. And the interesting thing was that everyone our family visited or came to visit us were genocide survivors in New York. The interesting thing was to add to your, to your wonderful presentation was that the Armenians during World War II came together and made these wonderful, wonderful care packages and took it to the church and hosted any of the Armenian servicemen that were from the New York, New Jersey area, you know, and Pennsylvania area that would come and they would have these wonderful banquets to honor our Amer Amer Armenian American servicemen. So I don't know if they did that in New England, but in a New York general area, sir, it was a wonderful thing to see as a child. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, well, I didn't have time to get into this, but um, if you look at the Armenian American newspapers from the 1940s, uh, there are also a lot of letters about from these uh, GIs before they get shipped overseas, when they when they're um, at an army base or a navy base near an Armenian community, uh, the local Armenian families would always bring the soldiers in to eat. <laughs> And as I said, uh, this is one of the themes that I found in, the, in these letters is that, you know, how much they missed Armenian food and once they got to an Armenian home, uh, how, how, how warm they felt by the generosity of the local Armenians in that particular area. So like a guy from Boston gets shipped down. Uh, there was even uh, some Armenian family near Fort Benning, Georgia of all places. And uh, the, when the Armenians went to Fort Benning uh, for training, uh, this local Armenian family would have them over uh, uh, when they got a weekend leave. Uh, my question is regarding the, uh, the Kartosian case. Uh, you mentioned, I don't remember the name of the gentleman who funded a quarter of the committee's uh, budget, and he took a hit in the Hyrenik for, 
as you described it. I'm curious, did he give that money before or after that? Because it'd be interesting to see if that sort of thing had an impact or not. Uh, Mr. Karagusian had committed that money right from the outset. Let's give our panelists one final round of applause. Before we, uh, before we break for lunch, we will have a special uh, presentation by Richard Holvanisian, who uh, if, I'm sure everybody in this room knows who he is, but for those who don't, he is a um, professor emeritus of Armenian and Near Eastern history at the University of Los Angeles, of uh, the University of California, Los Angeles. Today, he will be speaking to us about from ambivalence to assertion, an Armenian American passage. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. well, thank you very much. You know, they invited me here because I've become a museum piece. And, uh, and uh, so, you know, uh, and it's true. And it's true because wherever I go um, in recent years in Los Angeles and I meet people and professions, etc., uh, as we talk, they, they, the question they give me is, when did you, where, what country did you come from and what year did you come to America? And um, when I say I was born here, they say, wow, I mean, people were really born in America at my age? I mean, this, this all, uh, I mean, uh, which means that we don't really have much of a historical memory of our uh, community. I'm glad for this kind of a gathering that um, generates the wrong, I mean, the, the ro the right people that should be here or not here because sure that to, to learn that. Uh, and it seems for each wave of immigration that's occurred, whether it was in 60s and 70s from Middle East or later from Armenia, it's sort of as if American Armenian history begins with them and uh, that they start everything. Uh, well, some of us were born here in my uh, generation. I don't want to uh, it's, it's beyond lunchtime, and I'm not going to talk much about it except to say that it was um, a, a, a different kind of community, and particularly in California, the rural Ar Armenian communities. I grew up in Tulare with probably 10 or 12 uh, Armenian families. Um, there was a, a certain order to that family. They all came from Karper, uh, and many of them were related to each other, and unfortunately, since it was the 1930s, um, I, I was born at a time of, tr of, cr of, of great um, turmoil in the Armenian American community. Blood had been shed and our communities were torn apart. And so in our small town of 10 Armenian families, half of us did not communicate with the other half, visit the other half. Uh, I, uh, I think of about it now. I had not entered uh, two or three Armenian homes in my entire life in Tulare simply because of the political divide that, um, that gripped this community in the 1930s. Um, we had our own class system. Uh, because we were farmers, most of us had 15 acres or 20 acres, and if one man had 40 acres, he was the aga. He was the very, uh, you know, he was the lord of the, uh, 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 of the area. But it was a, a wonderful generation. I, I, when I reflect upon the survivor generation, which I thought would always be here uh, and disappeared, but um, they were really survivors. And I say I still ma marvel at the fact that um, even though they had seen such horrors, many of them had lost their entire family uh, and had to create new families or had been divided from their 
uh, because they had come to America to work and make money prior to the genocide, and some of them were reunited later. I remember in, even in the 1930s, women coming from Haleb, from Aleppo, uh, with uh, tattoos all over their faces because they had been with the Bedouins, and, and, and it was a, really a great reunion, and people would want to know what had happened to their families, etc. cetera. But, um, I say I was, uh, I marveled now in retrospect uh, because they were, um, could be happy. When I, if I had lost my entire family 15 years earlier, I'm not sure at all that I could be singing and dancing, you know, we ha but they did. Mink Donanink, Donakidikinche, you know, the, the name day of someone. We didn't have birthdays, but we, there were St. Sarkis and Hovanes and Mogadish and when on their name days would light a candle and go to their homes. And uh, it, w it was a party uh, of, of happiness. And there was also a pecking order, you know. Um, the men would sit at the head of the table and the women would sit at the lower end and the children wherever they were. And even then there was a division of generations. As the men sat in the porch and played cards, the women were in the parlors uh, uh, gossiping and, and, the, and the children disappeared the children disappeared into the bedrooms, um, and you know, and so that happened uh, there. The, uh, diasporas are supposed to be nostalgic, and they were. It was a very nostalgic generation, but they didn't have, I think, that longing uh, uh, or belief of return uh, that most diasporans uh, do have of wanting, you know, a connection with a homeland. Uh, they had come and they were making their best. My generation, I think probably I'm not typical, I'm not sure, um, really had a very serious identity uh, crisis and issue. Uh, I was not comfortable being an Armenian child of an immigrant. Uh, I, I was in an immigrant environment and I wanted to get out of that and uh, therefore I really wasn't excited about trying to speak Armenian or no Armenian and uh, on the contrary, on the contrary, looking to be accepted by the non-Armenian world. Uh, I went to a Baptist church and I joined uh, various non-Armenian organizations and I don't regret that I should say. Uh, Non-Armenian organizations were windows for me to know how the world operated. I mean, young, youth, youthful world. Uh, now we have in our schools Model United Nations and, and such groups, but in my time we didn't have them. In at least Armenian children didn't have access to them. And so what I want to say is I think uh, being a part of the greater world, uh, comfortable in that, getting to learn in that, greater world. You know, we as, I, I was an immigrant, I always remember this immigrant child, um, the word who and whom, you know, I still don't use them properly, but I, at least I know what I didn't know then, and that is I thought when I was an eighth grader that who was singular and whom was a plural word. And it was not until I went to high school and took Latin that I understood that, the, 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 you know, there are cases. Uh, and again, as I say, uh, we don't use the words correctly now, perhaps, but at least I know that. These are things we didn't know as, as immigrant children. And I, I tried to get into the outer world, and as I say, I don't regret it because that was important, but I'm glad I didn't stay in that outer world, and, but was able then to pick up um, the other. Uh, you know, this book, um, Family of Shadows, by my grandson, got in. I, I hope you'll get a copy if you don't have one, because it's really our story of American Armenians, of my father, my father's generation as a, as a uh, survivor of the horrors, losing everybody in his family, and um, survived only by chance because the Kurds took him away uh, to work uh, as, as a shepherd, and he ran away and got to America to Ellis Island in 1920, and my generation, at least me, and many others like me who were not happy or comfortable being ethnic, uh, wanted to shed our ethnicness and become uh, Anglo. Uh, multiculturalism was not in. Uh, you heard about the stories in Fresno, and I remember I'm still embarrassed to this day. I went for two years to Fresno State, and the first 
day I went to English class, a very nice old woman uh, teacher said, when I, she looked at my name, and she said, oh, you're Armenian. And I said, yes, but I'm not from Fresno, as if that made such a big difference, <laughs> you know, that I'm Armenian, but I'm not, you know, I'm different. I, I, I'm, from, I'm from Tulare, 40 miles away. Uh, uh, so, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad that um, I met individuals in my life um, that made me understand uh, that, that one can um, be an ethnic and, and bicultural. It took some time, and I'm, I'm glad I'm there. And I think today our strongest people are our third generations who have combined that outer world, the fluency of the outer world. We've heard speakers up here today who can speak fluently in any kind of society, in any kind of environment, and that's what we were given uh, by our parents and our grandparents. And then to add to that the Armenian component, which enriches our lives and enriches the lives of our children. And this is, I think, um, where we want to go from being this ambivalent person, as I was an ambivalent person, uh, to one that comes to a place where you can be assertive, uh, to be able to talk to any audience. I mean, I was pleased uh, two weeks ago that I was spoke to a gathering of all the principals of the Glendale Unified School District at a single place. I mean, you know, this was unimaginable for this little farm boy uh, who didn't know the difference between who and whom. So it takes work, it takes some commitment, uh, and um, I, I'm happy uh, to be here uh, with you, and I guess the the message is uh, from this fossil is that try and strive uh, to combine the universal and the specific. You know, we don't just want to be our ethnic Armenians. We want to also become universalist persons. And that is, I think, the whole story when it comes down also the genocide. Genocide, if we leave it as an Armenian issue, goes zero place. It stays with you and dies with you. And if you don't make it in a part of human history, uh, the human story, then you know there's no there's no chance. So thank you very much. Yeah. Well, all right. Hi. Okay, uh, so in occasion of your presence here, Professor, uh, in the name of conference organizers, we have a special gift for you. I know how important is this year for you, not as an American Armenian, who is a part of celebration of 400th anniversary of arrival of Martin the Armenian, not as a Californian Armenian, we are celebrating also 250th anniversary when first Armenian came to California, but it was also centennial of the Republic of Armenia. You dedicated your whole life for studying that part of our history and memory. So please, Mark, let's, let's do our part of the uh, job. So special, special gift, special um, surprise will be soon displayed to you, but this goes to the pro uh, professor. Uh, this is, these are the currency of the First Armenian Republic, uh, printed in London, and uh, uh, never, unfortunately, the Republic didn't last long enough for it to get into distribution, but it was uh, distributed in our communities as souvenirs and fundraising for the Armenians, uh, orphans. And as a museum man, I have to say that all things here are originals. Oh, really? Wonderful. 
Could I also ask Peter Masurlian to come up? Your name was chosen at random. No, please come up, Peter. Well, we continue our sessions. We can postpone this, this important part of the event for a little later period, okay? We have something <laughs> for you. Yeah. We'll give it to Don't you. worry about it. It's ready, I can assure. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, all of our presenters. Now let's eat lunch.